Coming to you from high atop our studios in the San Francisco Bay Area, you're listening to Tech Move. This is episode 45. In today's show, it's centered around Keith's report from their showroom floor of IBC 2018. We talked to the folks at Blackmagic Design, Aperture, Atomus, and Xeon. We also talk about the new products like the iPhone XS, the Canon R, the Panasonic S1 and S1R, and the Mavic 2 Pro. I'm Rod Louie, and with me is Keith Moreau. Get ready. It's time for another exciting episode of Tech Move. Let's go! Well, welcome our fine listeners to another great episode of Tech Move. I am your host, Rod Louie, and always joined by the lovely and vivacious Keith Moreau. <laughs> Keith, how are you today? I'm feeling quite vivacious. Today. Good, good, as you as well you should be. Uh, I, I'm, I'm telling you, the, the jet setting that you've been doing, especially <sighs> on behalf of Tech Move, and our listeners, universe-wide, is nothing short of heroic by you, and I thank you and applaud you for it. Thank you very much, Keith. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> because thank you, you know what's great is that if it wasn't for you traveling around like that, we'd probably have zero content to, to share with everybody. So thank goodness for you. We appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, Thanks, and, hey. and, and, uh, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. I, just, I was just going to say it's a pleasure and fun. Uh, great. Fun. I, yeah. I wanted to, though, kind of uh, start off our little introductory because the reason why I mention all this is that today, ladies and gentlemen, you are in store for a great treat. We have the 2018 IBC show uh, that Keith is just fresh off the plane from, uh, yes. from Amsterdam, uh, going to check out. For you and for me, some of the latest things that are going on in the world that we live in, which is tech move. Uh, yes. Keith, uh, where was where, how, when was the show? The show is every year about the same time, kind of mid mid September, and it's actually in Amsterdam. So what did I say? Um, I think I What's said Amsterdam. What did I say? Did I say Amsterdam? I did say Amsterdam. Didn't well, you I? did say where. So I said. Oh, yeah. No, thank you. Okay, go <laughs> you on. asked where. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's in Amsterdam. It's at this, um, like, one of the main convention centers, kind of like the Las Vegas Convention Center, but of Amsterdam. It's called RIA, and I actually don't know what that stands for. But I, I think now the RIA, isn't that a hotel chain out there in Europe? I you you knew, you would know better than me. We could I, look it up, but I, th I think I, that it is. But I, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> that, that's could, fine. Could could be could be a big company out yeah. there that bu bigs bu that builds big buildings and right. does construction and builds you know dams for all the dams in <laughs> Amsterdam. I don't know. Right. You know the, either that well, or, so, or, or 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 they're getting uh, uh marijuana money out there. So well well that's you know goes without saying. Correct. But um. But speaking, okay, so Amsterdam is famous for the, for the um, the things called coffee shops, yep. which are basically like, kind of like Starbucks with the, the addition of cannabis. Correct. <laughs> yes, this is absolutely true. Yes, and uh, it's really interesting because it's just so prevalent there. It's kind of amazing, and then it's also known for the red light district, right? Yes. Um, so those are the two things that everybody there has to go to, right? Because yes. they wouldn't be going to Amsterdam, but. Amsterdam is is also just just an amazing uh, kind of unique ish city. I mean, I think we know that it's kind of watery. There's canals and things like that. It's it's um, an absolutely beautiful city. Been there. Yeah. Uh, myself. Oh, you've been there. Okay. Yes. So yeah. So it's um. But the thing that I was actually kind of reading about, kind of got interested in how Amsterdam like came about, and you know, it's basically just these people that 
you know, didn't want to be attacked. And so they just started building little mounds of dirt in the middle of the, the swamp marsh that was kind of near the ocean. Kind of like a lot, a lot of, a lot of things that are near the water bays or oceans are usually kind of swampy for a while. Right. And, uh, but you know, mankind has kind of built those areas up. So it's all paved and look perfect. But before that, you know, before that era, there were just these swamps that people would build these islands on essentially. So, and then the islands kind of grew and then they kind of merged, you know, one tribe's island merged with another tribe. <laughs> right. And, and, and then all of a sudden you have this like landmass and, and it's, it's pretty interesting because the whole, I think the whole area of Amsterdam is actually below sea level. So the only reason it's not continually flooded is because they have dams. Right. And that's why it's called Amsterdam or Rotterdam or all these dams. Cause the sounds are basically based around these dams. Right. So it's just fascinating that you could just create a whole society based basically on these man-made islands and dams holding the water back, you know? And and, so. you, and you know what I love about walking around there is just all those cute little bridges going through all these water streets, right? Yes. And the photography opportunities that are in Amsterdam are just terrific. I mean, just the scenes and stuff like that. And I'm not talking about the red light district, everyone. Relax. <laughs> everyone relax. I'm talking about, like, the cool old bikes that are, like, tied up to the bridges and all that kind of oh, stuff. Uh, yeah. you, I, I got some fantastic pictures when I was there. Uh, of course, using the trusty GH1 uh, back way back when. And uh, just a terrific setting. Terrific picturesque European setting. Yes. I love yes. it. Yes. Yeah. It's it's so picturesque and it's and the people are really nice and friendly, pretty laid back. And they you, speak you, English. They all speak English very well. They all tend to smoke a lot. That's the only negative. But um they also tend to ride their bicycle bicycles quite recklessly. Um and you really have to watch out for them cuz every pretty much everybody goes everywhere with a bicycle. And I found out there's actually more bicycles than there are people there. There's 1.2 or 3 million bicycles and there's one eight hundred fifty thousand people there. Oh, that's pretty neat. Yeah, um, oh, and about neat. and I, and I can't remember. Ex- it was like a couple hundred bicycles fall into the canals every day, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> and they actually have a a full time barge with a big grappling arm that that lifts all the junk that falls into the canals, <laughs> and it and it lifts it up and puts it onto its barge. And there's this huge stack of bicycles on the barge every day. It's like us here in America where all those people are fishing out like shopping carts from uh, Safeway or Vons, right? I mean, yes, uh, times sa- exact a billion same thing. Yes, times a billion. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, it's same. so. But anyway, um, and then as you kind of kind of go more inland, like towards the continent, um, there's less and less of the canals, and that kind of makes sense because it's just less and less less and less water to hold back. And so the the RIA thing is kind of in more, a little bit farther out, <clears throat> not so close to the water. But, um, yeah, but it's just gigantic, huge, um, cuisine and just overall like treatment of people is, I feel like it's way better than NAB. Mm-hmm. Hopefully if there's no NAB officials listening to this or maybe they will be and they'll improve their show. But, you know, when you go there, you get greeted by, um, you know, a really nice person that takes your information and then gives you all these treats. Like they give us a, a transit pass, each of us. So we could ride around the, the subways yeah, like all week, um, they gave us free free food and drink tickets, so we could actually buy meals. Um, they don't do any of that at NAB. <laughs> they just right like barely give you a badge and yeah. send you on, on your way. <laughs> and, oh no, and and make you pay seven dollars for the hot dog or something like that, like oh, ballpark yeah. prices. Yeah, and the food, just the food in Europe in general, is just overall pretty high quality compared oh, to the yeah. U.S. Yeah, oh, just it, the. It's wonderful over there. Wonderful, especially yeah. and especially in uh, Amsterdam. Amsterdam food's great. Um, so anyway, yeah. So just the overall experience of the show was great. We we went there on the last day of the show, and it was actually great because I think the the, the craziness had subsided, so it was a little bit easier to get in places, and that was probably why you know maybe some of the recordings were a little bit smoother than sometimes. Just because there was a less less hassle to get things set up, and and did you did you find that to be an advantage this time? Because you know I know how tough it is at NAB. I know how tough it's been at 
uh, you know, CES and all this uh, and all these places when, yes. you know, everyone's just trying to get in, uh, you know, this seemed to work out pretty good for us this time, right? Yeah, it worked out really well because pretty much we could go anywhere we wanted. We didn't have to have a, um, like a press um, interview time slot. We just kind of went there and people were usually pretty free or if they weren't free, they they were free in a couple minutes and then there weren't like crowds of people getting in our way and going in between the camera and, and the, uh, and the, and the interviewee and me. So, yeah, so it was pretty easy. Um, our tech was pretty much unchanged. It's been unchanged for years, although I think we upgraded the iPad last year. So that's the reason for the better video. <clears throat> oh, yeah. maybe that, maybe that's why it looks really good there. Yeah. I think we try to do it in 4K, although I, th I think I, I checked my iPad settings and I think it was 1080p, but it was done with uh, Filmic Pro mm -hmm. with uh, the high bit rate. So it was, it was you know, that's another thing. With, so Filmic Pro is an app that you can use for an iPhone or iPad. <clears throat> and it's a, it, it really adds a lot of professional features to um, to the recording. It's not like just using the, the Photos app for video. It's, it's much more professional. Like yeah. you can adjust audio levels. You can adjust the codec. You can even you can even just um, the picture profile to make it a flatter profile. Oh, nice! With, so you can with, color grade after. Yeah, you can. You have more room to color grade. This is still not you know unlimited color grading. It's not like I don't think it's like ten bit recording, but um, but the bit rate can be higher than the normal iPads uh, recording. So overall, it's just a better better experience, um, better quality experience to record with it. And then <clears throat> we just use the same um, trusty C one thousand. Uh, AKG microphone that's about 30 years old which I yeah. love I love those types of uh, uh, mics you know what I mean like, yeah well, like my EV mic I'm using now yeah yeah they're they're just bulletproof I can't believe this thing has lasted as long as it's did throughout the years through all the use it's had it used to be my main singing mic when I was a singer in a band right and um, and they know, just work great they yeah. just work great the amount of spit that has been <laughs> That mic has endured, <laughs> the, and the and the amount of <clears throat> P's and B's that we've ever said uh, a lot to, of to, lot to of make, plosives. Yeah, uh, pl that's exactly right. To make the, <laughs> make those ribbons explode, right? <laughs> yeah. Just so glorious. Yeah. So it's awesome, Mike. Never had an issue with it. Chris probably is going to break tomorrow now that I said this. Right. But um, yeah. Uh, use a use a wire. Don't use wireless anymore. That. I tried that and it just ruined a couple of recordings in, in one of the NABs. So I just I'm not using that all. Well, all why anymore. why do you think that that's just not a good thing? Why 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 do you think that? I think there's just too much RF stuff. There's too many lights and dimmers and other wireless devices trying to be used, and it's just too much noise in the environment. And and also I probably get arrested there because the European. Um, frequencies are different than the u.s frequencies oh okay so probably if i use the u.s frequencies over there i would you know be intercepting some kind of emergency radio band and i would get swooped on by their version of swat right. and taken off <laughs> <clears throat> the european that's, swat that's right that's right yes. e e e either uh what is it her majesty's uh something <laughs> yes. her, 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 service yeah. or her majesty's yeah. secret service or something yes yes the, the royal dutch army yeah. yes. would be arresting me yes 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 <laughs> Well, good. I'm I I I'm I'm glad that the uh, beef eaters didn't get to you, and uh, you know those guards with the big hats. <laughs> I, I I'm glad uh, they didn't get to you, and that you chose to use a wired. Now you know what? In reality, wired can be a little bit cumbersome, right? Because of just you know so many people walking around in the show. You gotta watch out for people. All these dopey idiots who walk through the shots and stuff like that, right? Who are just not paying attention. Yes. Uh, how uh, uh, have you developed a way on how to stop people from uh, walking in front of the shot and stuff like that? Um, you know, honestly, just Veronica, who's doing the filming, she will put her hand out, put her arm out. Oh, good. And she's pretty good, pretty fast. I so. I, I would prefer that uh, we start bringing a chained link uh, <laughs> uh, borders uh, that you travel with that. Yes. And uh, oh, maybe really even heavy, right. Maybe even uh, yellow police tape uh, yellow, to surround yeah, well, the uh, the interview area. We could actually use that orange Hoodman tape. Oh, you know? oh, that's right. Oh, yes, that would be fabulous. Use. 
That'd yes. be fabulous. Either that or, you know what, IBC, NAB, CES, and all the other shows. Come on, let's get together. Tech Move needs a booth. We need a, uh, <laughs> we need a floor booth. We need to broadcast live. We need to be there, uh, a, a three-camera set to uh, deliver these fine interviews to our uh, uh, to our beautiful universe uh, that is out there. I, I, I'm putting that out there. Please show, uh, uh, show us a little bit of respect and gratitude and give us a, a stage and uh, some sort of uh, some sort of thing like that with unlimited yes. Pepsis and diet Cokes. Yes. So um, Kind of like a built-in fridge, like a glass oh, yeah. bowl. I would enjoy aquarium that. type thing. Yeah, I aquarium would, type thing. I would thing enjoy with, that. Okay, I, I would enjoy well, that. So. Okay, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll make that happen we'll by next time. That. Well, yeah. uh, okay. So, uh, Keith, you you were really really fortunate to get uh, some really great interviews here, and Thanks. I think uh, we should uh, uh, get to them mm-hmm. uh, because we we we've got stuff from uh, Zion. Black Magic Design. Who else do we have? Uh, we have Aperture. We have Atomus. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that kind of pretty much it. I think that's pretty much it. But the, yeah. the, the, these are good ones, and, and uh, some some pretty good, uh, n- nice products. I have to say. So so these are pretty good. We also want to remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that not only listening to it is, of course, uh, utterly important here on our uh, podcast, uh, the Tech Move Podcast uh, Arena. But if you want to see some of these things, it'd be also great if you went to our website, right, Keith? Uh, that's techmovepodcast.com, where you can actually see all these interviews that Keith has conducted with all these different uh, uh, manufacturers. Uh, is there anywhere else that I, I know you were starting to develop some other ways that we can deliver the videos to the kids? Uh, uh, do you have any news on that, Keith? Well, we've got a YouTube channel. Oh, okay. Yeah. So oh, just good. go to Tech That's Move. That's how much I know. Yeah, go to YouTube slash Tech Move Podcast, I think, and you'll you'll find it. Or at least just do a search for I don't know if we have our own actual name channel yet. I think we need to have a certain number of subscribers. But We're getting there. Do, We're yeah, getting just there. Do, go to YouTube and do a search for Tech Move. We got it there. I've got a lot of the episodes up, even the audio-only ones. I just kind of put a little logo because uh, YouTube is being used a lot just for audio nowadays, too. Oh, okay. So, you know, I mean, the new uh, YouTube Red, you can actually play, and then you could just put it in your pocket. You don't have to have the app up, and you can also have it in the background. Yeah. So a lot of people listen to music that way now. Yeah, and yeah. it's a great way to listen to music. I, yeah. uh, uh, so I just went on there. It's Tech Move Podcast mm-hmm. is the uh, search you want to put in there. Of course, you yeah. could do Tech Move, but then there's a bunch of other things that are on there that we don't pay attention to. <laughs> so uh, anyway... Let's uh let's take a quick break uh mm-hmm. and we will get back to our 2018 coverage of the IBC show uh in Amsterdam featuring our very own Keith Moreau. I am Rod Louie. Let's stay tuned and we'll come right back with more on Tech Move. We're uh, doing our IBC 2018 coverage here on Tech Move. Rod Louie and Keith Moreau. Keith Moreau has uh, been able to secure the folks over at Atomus. And uh, they always have some great things to share and to show us. And Mm -hmm. uh, the IBC 2018 is no different. Uh, We got a chance to talk with uh, Travis Sims. And... uh, Keith was able to secure him, and it kind of evolved into uh, a, a, another sub-interview with a gentleman by the name of Zuli, who unfortunately we don't know his last name, so we can't give him any credit on it. But uh, these folks at Animus are uh, going to be introducing a new product called the Animus uh, Ninja 5. Uh, Keith, what is the Ninja 5? 
The Ninja 5 is basically a 5-inch uh, screen size recorder. And um, it's got um, a lot of elements to it that make it a bit more streamlined than previous um, Atomus products. Um, there's a, in the battery port in the back, there's a, an extra data port for doing different things that can be unlocked. And they have a few um, extra peripherals for that port already. Um, and uh, so it's and it's just got all these great monitor features as well. Very high brightness. I think it's a, a thousand nits, which is super bright. So you can use it during the day. And it's an HDR type monitor, so you can get high dynamic range out of it. And it's a recorder, so it's got all these best the best of all these worlds. And it's not that expensive. I think it's like seven hundred bucks maybe. So a pretty good deal. Um, just a lot of again, kind of a game changing type of system with the Atomus quality and the software. And we love that quality that they that they bring forth. So that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Hey, l l let's get to the interview. Let's come mm -hmm. back and let's talk about the Ninja 5. Mm -hmm. uh, once we hear this great interview with Travis Sims and Zuli from Atomus and our very own Keith Moreau right here on Tech Me. Hi, this is Keith Moreau with Tech Move IBC 2018. We're here at the Atomus booth. We're here with Travis, and Travis is going to talk about a brand new Atomus product. Yes, yeah, so this year at IBC, one of the big things that we're showcasing is Ninja 5. Uh, Ninja 5 is like our 7 inch monitor line, but we're stepping down into something form factor wise that a lot of people have been asking for, especially from the mirrorless side of the world. Um, and with the Ninja 5, you're getting a 4K 60p recorder. Um, you're also getting a thousand nit display and a new user interface. Additionally, on the back here, we're uh, showcasing our Atom X expansion port. That expansion port is going to allow us to open up to a couple new accessories that we're showing here at the show. One is a new NDI module. And additionally, we're also showing our new sync module that'll be there for things like time code, uh, generating sync for metadata back and forth. So now can you have different types of inputs with these modules? You'll be able to have different types of inputs with these modules. The first one, obviously, that's on board the actual monitor itself is the HDMI. Uh, but like I said, the secondary one will be NDI. And this uh, expansion port kind of opens us up to new opportunities for future module components. So what does NDI stand for? So this is a network display interface. So this is going to be for people that are doing a lot of online streaming, uh, people in the broadcast side of the industry. Uh, this gives them an advantage uh, and an opportunity to not only do the live capture and record, but also to stream out that same information. OK, so in this case, it's an output module. Uh, correct. So it would be uh, you're going to get the internal record, and then you're going to be able to output that information and send that to whatever you know online source you have. Do you have any plans for SDI input? Uh, that is something that we're definitely looking into. Um, it'd be premature for me to say anything else about that, uh, but definitely it is uh, something we know is a big ask from a lot of people. For me, I actually have a couple Atomus products. I've got the Shogun uh, Sumo, mm -hmm. and I've got um, the Inferno. Oh, fantastic. And uh, so one of the reasons I have those is, is for the raw recording sure. over SDI and then using the, the, uh, the uh, ProRes raw mm -hmm. codec. Does this support that? So the ProRes RAW codec is not currently supported on the Ninja 5 because, again, that's more a limitation of the connection from the camera. Uh, right now, all the cameras that are actually sending a RAW signal, that's an SDI issue. Um, so from an HDMI standpoint, you're still going to get an advantage there because with this recorder coming off a lot of the, especially a lot of the mirrorless cameras, they're sending out 10-bit versus the 8-bit internal record that they have. So you're getting higher bit rates coming into this monitor than you would with a lot of the internal records. But from a ProRes RAW perspective, uh, that's something that may be down the line. But uh, as of right now, that's a limitation of SDI versus HDMI. Some of the things that you're going to notice about this is our really great aluminum chassis on this. Uh, so just from a durability standpoint, it's uh, a, a vastly big new step for us. Uh, you're also going to notice HDMI on the side, as usual with a lot of the Atomus monitors. You have your input, your output. Um, on the back here, we're going to be working with a lot of our partners on uh, mini SSDs. So Sony is one of those partners, Angelbird being another one. Uh, but the mini SSDs are still going to work in the same way that your 2.5 SSDs work for all your 7-inch monitors and for your Sumo 19. Uh, but the advantage here is that the mini SSDs keep you nice and flushed with the side of the unit. But that also means you could use your existing SSDs if you want to. Might bring it a little bit out to the side. 
Uh, but also these mini SSDs will also work with the seven inches. There's a little mini SSD handle that we have right now that connects to these and that allow you to pull it in and out of the seven inches. On the back here where you have the battery, so if we actually take this unit off, you'll notice that there is a little expansion port down here. And that expansion port is gonna be the area where things like the new NDI module, the sync module, any future module we come out with is gonna be able to interface with the processing power inside the Ninja 5. Uh, and then of course you got your line, your mic, uh, you know, review in there and also your remote. Um, and yeah, pretty nice little small unit. Getting back to the, uh, the SSD slot, if you bought a off the street SSD, uh, uh, would stick out a little bit further? It would stick out a little bit further, like I said. So if you're using, you know, any of the partners, uh, SSDs that we've been working with thus far, G-Tech, AngelBird, uh, Sony, whoever it might be, yeah, those uh, would stick out a little bit from the side. So really it's more of a rig consideration than anything else. So if you're trying to cage it up um, and it's harder to access, um, you may want the mini SSDs just because it's not going to stick out and affect any of that. I think on my Sumo and my other units, I need to put SSDs into a cage, but that's not the case with these? Uh, you don't need to. So with the mini SSDs, well, you're talking about the actual the caddies, correct? The caddies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, these go into caddies still. I mean, this is a, a much thinner, smaller option, uh, but still the caddies are there just to help guide it into the slot. Um, but those caddies are also provided with the monitors themselves. So you don't necessarily have to go out and buy one. If you get a monitor, you get a caddy. I love the size of this unit. It's and the price point's pretty good, right? Yeah, uh, about 695 euro, uh, about the same in US dollars, 695. Uh, so from a price point perspective, uh, you know, pretty low, especially considering the brightness of the monitor. Even as just a reference monitor, uh, you know, really a great option. But you know, additionally, you have the recorder. As a reference monitor, tell tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so as a reference monitor, one of the nice things about this, again, coming back to a lot of the guys in the DSLR mirrorless side of the world, uh, a lot of these guys, uh, you know, have rigs that, you know, they need to have a lot of the professional tools that are at the disposal of the guys in the more professional side of cameras. Uh, one of the advantages here is that, like all the other Atomos monitors, you have the Atom OS, and with the Atom OS, you have the ability to get, you know, po peak focusing, uh, you have the ability to get false colors, zebras, uh, a lot of assists that are normally built into a lot of these cameras that are integrated into the monitor to kind of give you more of a professional operator, you know, view that you need. And how's this in daylight, brightness, et cetera? Well, because it's a thousand nit display in direct daylight, the really nice part about that is your viewing angle is really good. You don't have any fall off. You don't find that the glare is really as much of an issue. Um, additionally, if that is something that you are concerned about, uh, what we're also showing at the show this year is our Atom X accessory line, which is going to be approved Atomus accessories that not only we're manufacturing, but a lot of our third party partners are making. So we're working with guys like Sony on mini SSDs, Angelbird on mini SSDs, uh, Small Rig is making cages for these units. Uh, but if you are looking for something to kind of keep the sun out, uh, we do make our own sun hoods as well for the Ninja 5. That's awesome. Anything else you want to talk about? Uh, really, the other big things here at the show that we're showing off is uh, we announced it at NAB. It's been a long uh, feature that's been requested for the Sumo, uh, but we're showing our new switching uh, capability, our HD ISO record. Uh, so we're showing that off over here. And then in the ProRes RAW Theater, we're doing a lot of uh, you know explanations and showcasing how Final Cut and ProRes RAW and Atomos all work together. Oh, that's interesting about the Sumo. Since I have one, I'm a little interested in that. How about we go over there? And you can show it. I'd love to. Excellent. So we've magically appeared here at another part of the booth. Um, we're here with Uli, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about the new features of the Sumo. Yeah. The Sumo offers now a four-channel ISO recording switching feature, and we are able to connect up to four, three, up to 3G signals inside of that. And we are looking here now on the multi-viewer view, and we are able, as you can see, the green framed uh, first signal. We can switch then to all the others in the same way. And if we would like to change any settings, we can also use a full screen. And then here uh, underneath, there are small buttons also to do the switching part. And we go back again if we press on this monitor. And all these four sources will be recorded as a single file. So you can access uh, every single file later on for the multi-camera editing. So are these uh, 2K or 4K files? These are uh, HD up to 3G, every file, yeah? So four HD signals recorded at once? Yes. yes. And uh, is this all 
come with whatever firmware upgrade you're going to offer? It's the latest firmware upgrade, what is already available since May. So we have it already. That's, that's great. So you have this many inputs in the Sumo? Yes, we have four SDI inputs. And uh, yeah, you can populate them uh, for Quadlink or for this ISO recording. Well, wow, that's, that's really awesome. I'm going to have to upload that firmware and try it out. <laughs> Well, I think I'm going to end the interview now. You've both been great. I'm going to sign off, but thanks a lot. This is really exciting stuff. Keith Monroe signing off for Tech Move. Travis Sims and Zuli from Atomus and our very own Keith Moreau on our continuing coverage of IBC 2018 with Tech Move and uh, the Atomus Ninja 5. Very interesting. So, mm -hmm. Keith, am I to... Um, uh, am, am I to understand that, you know, all the past Atomos, uh, uh products that have been out there, all the other recorders that, and, and I think you've owned at least one or two of them before, correct? Yes. Um, those were just larger uh, 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 products. So this one is just a, a smaller five inch, uh, but that much more powerful? Well, I think really honestly the claim to fame for this particular um device is the fact that it's small um everything else has been seven inches or bigger right so um you know that's it's it's kind of it's two it's only two inches but it makes a big difference oh yeah <clears throat> so and when you when you look at this um this monitor it's not not much bigger than a small hd focus mm -hmm. you know it's maybe you know it's it's a bit thicker but just it's it's not it's not very bulky. It's it's pretty streamlined, and yet it seems to be pretty solid. It can go so, into a laptop bag and and be very easy to transport and stuff like that. Right, right. And so, um, so the question is then, well, why would I just get a monitor when I can get a monitor and a really good recorder, and also something that has uh, the Atomus um, software in it, which makes you know, using it pretty, pretty nice. You know, it has very good user interface. Um, and also has all this versatility, uh, for potential upgrades. For example, he was telling me about a potential, um, way of spitting out IP video. So you can, you can use this as a recorder and then you can get this extra model module to put into the battery port. So the way the battery port works, it's like an L series battery port, you know, that, that common Sony battery that everybody uses big battery cheap a lot of third-party makers mm -hmm. um, so it's got it's got that receptacle in the back but they also sell um, extra modules n n uh, Atomus sells extra modules that plug into there and then have a receptacle for a battery so you still can put a battery on it but then you can get extra functionality um, from that port and so there's there's power terminals on on this on this uh, receptacle and there's this kind of data connector as well um, and so I, I would love to see, um, an SDI input for that because then I could use my raw output recorders, which can put raw over SDI right now. You can't put raw over HDMI. And right now this Ninja is only an HDMI recorder. It only accepts HDMI, mm -hmm. but I imagine in the future they'll come out with an SDI input module, which you can plug in the back and you can then use your small FS5 or, or other raw output device and go through SDI to this small, um, this small screen recorder and have a really portable and yet super high quality system. So I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for that particular peripheral to come out for them, from them. And it, 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 it really seems like it's, it's just as powerful, if not more powerful than, than, than the predecessors. And, um, so I, it sounds very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I think it's a cool product. I think it's about time. I think they've been, been asked for it for years. I think they just had to get the technology to the point where, um, the electronics were such that they wouldn't generate so much heat. That the thing about the bigger monitors is not only is it a bigger screen, which it has some, has some uh, benefits, sure. but there's a larger surface area for the whole thing. So there's a lot more heat dissipation possibilities. Right. And when you start shrinking things down, that's, this is always, this is the bane of all electronics makers is the smaller you get it, the smaller surface area you have for heat sinks and things like that. So if you're still doing some things that require a lot of processing power, you have to figure out a way to dissipate that heat. Right. Um, whether it's through a, 
you know, a fan that can generate noise um, or through just a large heat sink or whatever. So I think they, they got the electronics small and, and, and less wasteful uh, to fit inside this. And it's just a matter of technology. You know, technology marches on. Um, but this is just, in, in general, the bane of existence for all miniaturization of electronics. You know, that's why it's so amazing that you can get an iPhone to work, you know, when it's so small and thin and, and still doing all these powerful things. You know, that's right. that's a quite an achievement. Right. So, yeah. So, so in, in, in your personal style of usage, is a 5-inch screen more beneficial than the 7-inch uh, or larger? Uh, I mean, I kind of, uh, you know, 5 inches is great for run and gun, portable, you know, different, lo you know, location sets. But the seven inch is something that's really nice for, you know, setting up a shot, focusing, so on and so forth. So, you know, how, uh, what do you honestly see yourself using going forward? For me personally, I probably wouldn't get this right away. Um, just because I don't necessarily have a need for um, this particular product. Mm -hmm. um, because I have the Shogun, which is the seven inch version. It's a lot bigger, heavier, yep. bigger screen. Uh, does more, has SDI inputs and and does, you know, raw recording and stuff. But but I could see this because of the price point and the fact that it's a really good monitor. Why should somebody get a, a really good monitor for 500 bucks when they get a really good monitor and a recorder for 700? Yeah. That's right. the thing. Yep. So it's a good price it, point, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's, you know, an awesome uh, product. I think they're going to sell a ton of them. I think it's just one of those things that's gonna, they're just going to sell a lot of these just, cool. uh, because of the price point and the quality. Yeah, well, and they always put out good stuff. Let's, um, let's talk uh, a little bit about the other uh, item that uh, was part of the interview, and that's oh, yeah. uh, uh, the switcher. Yes, uh, so... You know, I have a Sumo that I got a while back. I got it on sale. Um, it was one of those deals that B&H runs, and it was for like a day only, and it was like a third off or something. So it was a really good deal. Um, and I sometimes need a big monitor if I'm setting up kind of like creating a studio situation, and it's really nice to have a big monitor for people to look at, not just myself. And then I, I have a lot of confidence when I look at it that things are in focus. And if I, So if I have time to set up, I'll bring this huge, heavy Sumo with me and just set up there and kind of create like a little video video village with it. Um, and, and you know, as long as I don't need to be too portable. So if I'm kind of stationary and, 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 and I'll use that because it's kind of big and heavy. Um, great image, great, great recording quality, um, lots of good stuff with it. Uh, I didn't realize that there's a way to use it as a switcher, which sometimes I do too on like live events and things like that. So, um, yeah, just Travis mentioned, oh, yeah, and the Sumo does the switching thing and i said really it does because i thought it was like a new feature that came out and actually the software came out like months ago i guess i'm just behind the times <laughs> oh so you haven't up you haven't firmware it or anything like that no i haven't but it intrigued me so that's why we talked about the switching aspect and how it works so you basically there's a bunch of bnc sdi connectors in the back so you can um you can connect your uh your cameras through sdi to these various inputs up to four cameras and then uh, you can use it as a, and, a, and you can record in HD uh, and switch in HD and you can uh, record up to four different uh, and switch up to four different streams, streams just by, you know, clicking on the one you want. So it's kind of cool for a multicam like live setup or multicam setup where you don't want to spend a lot of time editing later. You just want to kind of record it live and not, and not, and then give the customer the product right after a minimal amount of uploading and stuff like that right yeah so that was pretty cool and i i, I have this i have this you know brand new feature in my sumo and i don't even know it <laughs> so 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 uh I, again all that it's going to take is a firmware update on your part correct excellent yeah those are the best I'm, kind of gifts i know it's awesome I, I i love that when 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 companies like that atomus uh will 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 just Go ahead and and firmware update something, and wow, it, it makes it a whole new, gives new life to uh, uh, to what you thought you, you you originally bought something, didn't expect it. Now you get this new cool new feature, makes uh, 
makes a great uh, little gift. I love it. It is. It was like a little Christmas present. Fabulous. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay, so that's uh, Travis Sims and Zuli, who uh, were both kind enough <laughs> to join us for uh, for the Ninja 5 and the Sumo Switcher. Um, and uh, Keith, thank you very much for uh, getting them to... Uh, talk to us and uh, You're welcome. Yeah, so that's fantastic. Okay, let's. Uh, we're gonna wrap up our uh, our coverage of IBC 2018 in just a moment. We're gonna take a quick bit break, and we'll come back with more here on Tech. So it's IBC 2018 uh, and Tech Move, and our continuing coverage. Uh, with our man about the street, Keith Moreau, and Keith uh, went and tackled and uh, held hostage the people at Zion uh, over there to talk about some new products. And I believe, Keith, you spoke to, uh, a, 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 you know, a, at least for us, a relatively uh, famous guy, Chung Da. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so we immediately sought out the Zion booth. And IBC is just vast, and um, it's uh, sometimes not that easy to find stuff. Um, but they actually have a pretty good app, iOS app, which made it which made it a lot easier. And so we we kind of went towards um, their booth. There's actually a couple posts of going towards their booth on Instagram. I was just doing like a little uh, selfie thing with my iPhone. Oh, uh, just there. kind of like following yourself and stuff. yeah, kind of. Yeah, so and you, then I should have used the Zion Crane for that. I, so, I uh, could have, but then yeah, then we wouldn't have made it but uh, <laughs> uh so i so i go to the booth and and it's luckily um this is the last day of the show and it's not that early so um there's it's not super crowded there which is great because sometimes these places you can't even get through they're so packed um zion the zion booth was not too crowded i talked to um one of the people there they said oh yeah this is the guy chung da he's the he's the kind of the evangelist rep i think there's some name for him he's like it's some official name. I'm not sure what they call them, um, but evangelist. Zion know, Master or something like that. <laughs> yes. Grandmaster um, Chung of Zion. Right. And so he had one of those um, one of those uh, easy, easy rigs on his back, um, which was holding up the super heavy combo of the, of the Crane 3 lab. And um, I think I might have been... I'm not sure which camera it was. I think it was a Canon camera, but I'm not positive. I can't remember. We can look at the footage. But um, it was definitely a big, heavy combo, and that's probably why he needed the, <laughs> the easy rig. Well, um, I think that, that that's... And, and, you know, I don't want to give the, the interview away. Maybe we'll talk about it, uh, you know, after we come back from the interview. But that's the whole... I, I, I would imagine he wants to kind of put on a heavy thing because that's what the the whole rig is all about, is be able to hold much bigger uh cameras and and the like yeah that's its claim to fame is to it's just a more powerful and yet still kind of a single handled gimbal although it's still it actually has two handles so it's not really <laughs> it's not like a, the wide the wide stance uh gimbal it's like one handle is used for different purpose <laughs> yeah and, well well and, 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 and the neat thing that it looks like is that it can easily convert to you know the, the 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 regular way you use these harnesses or what they've really become famous for which is like the single handle type of thing yeah yeah so, so it looks pretty cool yeah. and probably won't be too expensive so so there's that one and then he also whipped out another one which i didn't even know about um so that so the one we we're talking about the big one's called the crane 3 lab and then the smaller one is called the weeble lab and so they're both new ones they're both prototypes they're not out yet they'll be out in a while but um yeah, we'll listen to the interview and get a little more information about it. That's fantastic. Okay, so here we are. It's Tech Move on our uh, coverage of IBC 2018. Keith Moreau and Zion's own Chung Da right here on Tech Move. This is Keith Moreau here at IBC 2018 for Tech Move. We've got Chung here of Zion, and he's going to show us one of the brand new Zion products. Hey, Chung. Hi, so this is the newest uh, concept model of Zion, the Crane Free Lab. It goes up to 4.5 kilograms because a lot of people have been asking for like the C200, the V1 and the FS5 to be mounted onto a gimbal. But we totally redesigned it for that because holding those cameras itself is quite heavy, especially 
mounted onto a gimbal, it becomes even heavier. So we needed to do a total redesign of the gimbal, especially they want it to be a single-handed gimbal. This is usable as a single-handed gimbal and also here with this top handle. So this top handle design is mainly so for the easy rig use. So it's much easier to use for a prolonged period because uh, basically I can leave it hanging like this and it'd be much lighter uh, without uh, having any strains on my arm. And um, this model has a few special features. Uh, there will be two servo motors on here. So you can actually control both the zoom and the focus of the lens. So there is a zoom rocker over here and a focus over here. Also, we have quite a lot of uh, like total, uh, yeah, things to make things easier. So we have actually locks on every axis so we can lock down every axis for uh, transport so it doesn't flop around, but also for balancing all the angles. So you know, most of the time people had to hold one piece to balance it. Now it, you can lock down that section so you can balance the other sections. Also, uh, we have this tripod feet over here. This is removable. So you have like a very short um, yeah, size for it. So you can travel it quite easily put it in your backpack. You don't need a big case for this. Also, if you are using a Steadicam or uh, like original Steadicam, you can mount this on top of it. Uh, this makes you add like a gimbal function to your uh, uh, Steadicam, but also a lot of remote control. So this has a connector box on the bottom. So you can connect a HDMI from your camera to the connector box and it sends a Wi-Fi signal to your phone. You can use your phone as a uh, monitor. But because we have all these uh, servo motors that comes out for it, uh, the second person or assistant can focus for you or zoom for you. So you can uh, work mostly on aiming where you want it to go and a second person can help you with all those. And also uh, because this is still a concept or a, a prototype, there's still going to be several changes for that because we've been here at IBC uh, trying to get a lot of feedback. We've uh, gotten feedback from EasyRig, uh, what can be improved, adding few features and also from other manufacturers. So yeah, from this, actually we have like a different gimbal come out of this because we have the WeBuild. Uh, I'll actually grab that one. So this is like a smaller version of this. So this also has like the 45 angle uh, on here and we have, even though it looks like a small gimbal, this is actually up to three kilograms. And we've tested it out with a 5D Mark IV with a 24 to 70. And here we have the grip that is also removable to make it much shorter to travel with and put in your bag. But also we can put this handle up here. So we get the same kind of design with the top grip. And also all the angles are lockable so we can Actually, I'll knock this. Actually, see if there's power here. Now, is this a prototype as well? Uh, this is not right now a pre-production. Uh, it's pretty close to finished. Uh, it should be um, somewhere in October that we will see this, uh, the final version of this one. Uh, this one should be around November. So this is like a crane too, but everything became much smaller. So it's a much smaller setup to use. So this is as powerful as a crane too? Uh, it's three kilograms. It's slightly less, but it's still like for most DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, this is usable. But this is, this is really aimed for a lot of the travelers, vloggers to have like a much smaller compact size to travel with. So you don't have like a big backpack for or a big case for everything. And uh, this also will have, this has a follow focus and will also have like a small server motor. So only for the focus though on this one in, uh, and not adding a zoom. Uh, this has pretty much, um, yeah, all the design features from here came to this small package. So we think this will be like one of the more interesting ones. Um, however, this is more for the professionals, but most people would probably go for this uh, uh, rebuild version. So is there, I really like this, um, although I was more interested in that, although this is a really interesting uh, new new design. I also noticed you have this offset um, 
What is this access called again? Uh, the raw access has been offset, so uh, people have been asking to do that so the screen is more visible. That is also on this version. Uh, the Yeah, it makes it quite easy to see, but also we haven't done a extreme off access that is very low, but uh, we did that because we wanted to keep the package much smaller for traveling. Gotcha. So is there a way that we could possibly take this off of the easy rig and maybe you could do a little handheld holding with it? Okay. okay, yeah. I have this exact setup. So this can be handheld like this. So to alleviate some of the weight from your hands, it, we added this section for to put against your chest. So you can also change the angle for uh, yeah, different persons, how they want this angle to be. So you could actually flip that down and then hold it with two hands? Um, no, that is just only like offset the angle just for the people who likes it in a different angle against their chest. So you wouldn't use your other hand on this? It's, uh, no, this only when you use it uh, like this, uh, like the upside down mode, you can use both hands. But when you're using it like this, it's mostly like this, holding it like this. What if you wanted to have a two-handled mode for this, like you have for the crane too? Um, right now, we are looking into accessories because this is still like a prototype. Uh, the accessories will come later than the uh, final product. So uh, the uh, product will come first before all the accessories. So we're looking into feedback on how the accessories need to be because the design is totally different right now. So we have to see what, uh, how we can attach those. Would you be able to share what some of the comments were for, for some of the improvements on this design? Yeah, right now we have a Rosetta here for a monitor. So we have like a small uh, attachment for that. But uh, right now for in this mode, it's OK. But when we go for the upside down mode, especially on the easy rig, this becomes too close to you. So we've been uh, adding, uh, getting feedback to add a mount over here. So it's slightly further and more like the other like cinema cameras on having it on the top handle. Also, EasyRig asked us to add a uh, quarter inch on top of here for the new quick release mount. So it's much easier to use the quick release to remove it uh, without having to purposely clamp it like that. Um, yeah, those were pretty much most of the feedback. Uh, Do you have a price point for this? Um, the target price is uh, 1100 so aimed more for the professional. Well, that's really cool. So I, you, in the pre-interview, we talked a little bit about where you're from, your channel. Um, I assume you're a cinematographer of some experience in film. Maybe talk a, bit, a little bit about yourself. Um, so I'm originally from the Netherlands and I've moved to Hong Kong. Uh, I've done, uh, yeah, filmmaking, uh, done several uh, ones. Uh, short film awards across the world. So from San Francisco, Hong Kong, and also in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, my channel is mainly about filmmaking, teaching people how to do uh, like special tricks and also video editing. Uh, I've quite known for the seamless transition effects, uh, which quite a lot of people are right now using. Uh, also, um, yeah, pretty much, uh, yeah, I'm one of the Zion ambassadors. So I, on my channel also, of course, uh, teaching people how to use the gimbal in special ways. So it's not only a stabilizer, it's also much more. You can use it as like a crane or like a, get like a fake drone shot or even uh, get like a slider shot. So you don't need those extra gears and all be like in just one package. So where, where, should, they, where should people go to find you? Yeah, you can go to uh, youtube.com slash Shongda. So <laughs> So it's C H U N G D H A. Got it. Wow, this is this is pretty cool. I'm actually really excited about this. I have two other uh, Zion products. I have the Crane V2, and then I have the Crane 2. And you know, it's a little uh, confusing the naming convention. But this is the Crane 3, so it's totally separate, right? Yeah. So this will be Crane 3 Lab. This is actually like a one step above the Crane 2. So it's not, not like an equal footing. So it's like a whole jump up. Um, and the rebuild is slightly like a lower setting than the Crane 2. So it's not like replacing the Crane 2. So that's the two new products. Um, one of the things that I actually have is the little servo motors that operate with the Crane 2. 
is, is that going to be compatible with this or it's a brand new system? That's a brand new setup. So uh, also the USB ports are USB C Type-C right now instead of the older USB. Great. A lot of great info. Can't wait for this to come out. Thanks so much, Chung. We'll be checking out your channel. I'll be sending you some, some messages and links. So thanks so much. Keith Murrow signing off for IPC 2018. That's Chung Da from uh, Xeon, as well as Tech Move's very own Keith Moreau. Uh, Keith, I always loved uh, the Xeon cranes. Mm -hmm. they're, 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 you know, all this stuff. And now, is this is the uh, shoulder harness uh, uh, item that they're that they're demonstrating today? Is that new for them? Um, well, it's not their brand of shoulder harness. It's the Easy Rig. Okay. So you may have, you may remember a couple shows back. Uh, I actually interviewed the founder of Easy Rig, the crazy guy. Yes. That, yeah. So, yeah. So he's the guy that invented that, and and but the Easy Rig is used a lot for gimbals nowadays, um, just because they start when they start getting kind of heavy when you when you start uh, carrying them around all day. <laughs> oh yeah. And and uh, especially the single handled ones. Um, because you're holding them mostly with one hand or aiming the one thing. So the thing that was kind of cool about um, about this setup was that the back handle on this Crane 3, you can kind of use as a, kind of has a top handle on a camera. So the way the Easy Rig usually is used is there's a top handle on the camera and then there's a kind of clamp that goes around that. Correct. And, and so this um, extra handle on the Zion 3, Zion Crane 3, uh, it works kind of the same way. Uh, it just kind of goes in what's called flashlight mode, where you're tilting, um, you're tilting the whole handle part back towards you. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's kind of aiming. The camera's aiming forward, um, and then it's held up by almost like top a handle. fishing pole, right? Almost using it like a fishing pole of some yeah. sort. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily always use that because it's not that comfortable to. It gets heavier when you put it in that position. You know the leverage is working against you because sure. you got a lot of the mass in front of you. But, sure. but in the case of having this easy rig, it actually works great because you can use that that extra handle to get the center of balance and then just kind of balance it. Um, and it's all supported on your hips and a little bit on your back. So yeah, so that was actually a really good um, demonstration. Um, if you're going to use the Zion uh, Crane Three Lab without that. Uh, for any period of time, it might just start getting a little bit heavy. Mm. Um, but you know, just like all these other big, heavy single gimbals that are out now, like the like the DJI um, uh, single, the uh, Ronin S, yeah, uh, which is pretty heavy. Um, you know, this is starting to be a trend. So, you know, uh, I I actually attach a Zion extra Zion part sometimes to my to my uh, DJI. <laughs> uh, single <laughs> to get Franken that little extra Frankensteining it all together. Yeah. To get that little extra handle for a little more support. It works pretty, pretty well. So anyway, yeah. Um, interesting design, different kind of, kind of, kind of massive in a way, um, kind of going away from the single handled sleekness, but interesting. And I'm glad they're going forward and they're pushing the boundaries of these, of these single gimbals and kind of just changing how they work. It's actually pretty cool. They're very inventive. Yeah, see, it, 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 it seems pretty, uh, uh, they're always coming out with, and boy, they, uh, uh, they have really come out uh, really big over the last couple of years and r really making a name for themselves and, and doing extremely well uh, with, with all their products. So, uh, yeah, they really, it's, cool. it's, it's really weird because the gimbal market is, has cycled a lot in the last few years. Like yeah. a few years ago, Zion wasn't so big. There were some others that were that were bigger, like the Nebula and yep. and Came TV. Yep. And and actually those have kind of gone away. I mean, I don't I don't think there's a lot of I don't see a lot of marketing and, and, and media on those brands anymore. Um, you see a lot of marketing on Zion and a couple other, you know, DJI and a couple other brands. But yeah, so it's a pretty volatile market. Uh, but it's great that Zion is just kind of forging ahead with new ideas because it, it, it keeps everybody on their toes. It makes the technology better. You yep. Know, just for everybody. Yep. Exactly. So, really exactly. grateful for that. 
Yeah, it's great. So, uh, fantastic. Thanks very much uh, uh, to Chung and uh, Keith. Uh, thank you very much for seeking them out. Uh, you can find these things on the uh, website, uh, Z-H-I-Y-U-N.us. That's Zion. Dot us is uh, the way you can find some of their new products and stuff. Oh, and uh, more importantly, when I think, Keith, I think these things are available. Uh, I want to say the Crane 3 is available maybe in October, something like that. Do, do, uh, do you recall that? I honestly don't remember what he said. I don't think it was something that was... There was a set date on it. I don't. I think, there's not a set date, but I think they're yeah. hoping in October. Something Maybe like that. they're hoping. I think the we the we build app the yep. smaller. I, I think that's more in the future. I think that's next year. Right. I think so I, I I don't think he mentioned anything on that, but I believe he, yeah. he said something about October. So okay, anyway, that'd be great. Yeah. So folks, uh, uh, take a look at that, and uh, yeah, thanks thanks a lot, Keith. We yep. will come back with uh, with another fantastic interview and product. Uh, from IBC 2018 right here on Tech. So we have some old friends that are going to join us here on our Tech Move IBC 2018 coverage. Uh, Keith was able to secure our friends over at Aperture. And uh, specifically, we're going to talk to Ted Sim and uh, a real old friend of ours, Neris Nasarian. Uh, who was at the show uh, as well. And I think uh, Neris essentially uh, threw Ted in uh, for us to give us a little new blood or something like that. Uh, Keith, uh, it's great to see the Aperture guys again. Yeah, it is great. They're they're really fun guys. I, I love their company. I love their energy. It's pretty cool. They have really, they they have, you know, and folks, the, the interview you're going to listen to and maybe see uh, i should remind everyone you can see all these interviews that keith conducts uh on our webpage, which is techmovepodcast.com uh plus i think uh, keith is going to throw some various uh clips out there on various social media uh presence that we have um but you should really watch uh, these videos because, you know, even though we do such a spectacular job of illustrating uh, what they are uh, through our voices, there's nothing like seeing them uh, and seeing the video clips because these are all really terrific products that uh, Keith is able to, to, to show all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and Aperture's, uh has this great new uh, product uh, that they're that they're trying to introduce the uh, Ameren MW, I believe is the name of it. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to give too much away, but Keith, how, how, how was it talking to the Aperture guys there? I, I I know it was fantastic and stuff. What did you think of the product, real quick? At, at least what you thought initially going in. Product is great. It's great for um, a little eye light. Uh, it's really super powerful. It's really bright. A couple times he turned it on, it just blinded us couldn't see for minutes um and uh really innovative um good deal you know just like all their stuff really good fabulous fabulous yeah. so let's get to the interview right now it's uh let's talk uh to ted sim and neris nasarian over there at aperture on our continuing coverage of uh ibc 2018 right here on tech So we got Ted Sim here from Aperture. You <laughs> I almost I almost blew it because he just told me his name was mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. something else. Anyway, Ted Sim uh, from SimCity. Yes, we're here to talk about <laughs> the new SimCity expansion, Sims Deluxe Universe Mode. In the new Sims game, you not only make cities, but also planets and civilizations on them. You control the population of people and how happy they are it's great is sim city still out since you're i played sim city a lot as a kid i mean i don't know i don't know if it's still out i think the sims are still out like there's still new versions of the sims right is i think it's a phone app now and yeah, we, we should just download it and look it up right now no i'm just kidding so ted's going to talk a little bit about some of the new aperture products and We've, um, Neris just blinded us with a couple of them, so we're still seeing spots. So while we recover from that and our retinas grow back, 
We're going to have Ted talk about his new products. Cool. Well, as a blind man, I will tell you that this is a very bright light. Uh, this right here is the Amaran MW. The MW is the newest in our line of the Amaran M series. So if you guys know about the Amaran M9, the Amaran MX, the MX used to be the brightest LED on the, and the brightest mini LED on the market. It was approximately three times brighter than the Amaran M9. This one right here is the MW, and the MW is actually two times as bright as the MX. So blindingly bright, insanely, insanely powerful light. At maximum intensity, I get approximately 90 minutes of battery life. On minimum intensity, I will actually get 24 hours of nonstop use. So this little eye light here, you could rig this to the side of your camera, and no matter where you go, you can get that little specular highlight in the eyes. Now, what's cool about this light, though, is that W actually stands for something new that we've never been able to do in an aperture light before. And W here stands for waterproof, which means that this light can actually go three meters underwater. And we actually think before release, we're gonna see if we can do 10 meters underwater. No promises there, we're gonna do the best that we can. But what does that mean? Well, first of all, three meters means that I can leave this in the rain. I can, this is my perfect travel light, my adventure light. I can take this into the pool, a lake, a river. Uh, I can go surfing with this light. 10 meters means it would actually be a dive light, so I could take this deep underwater. That's a whole nother game. But if you wanted to do something like a surf effect and light someone going under a wave, you can do that now with the MW. So this light, we think will come out approximately in around December. The price is not set yet. We think it'll be about $250. So tell me how you guys test this light. How do we test this light? Well, we uh, actually do pressure testing. We will literally drop it meter by meter underwater. Uh, but then there's also pressure housing too. So we'll actually measure the amount of uh, like force that goes onto the light itself. I don't know the technical terms. I'm not one of the engineers, but they, do you have, yes. Do you have a big um, tank yeah. uh, at your office? <laughs> I don't have a tank in my office. Kind of like a swimming pool right next to your office for testing. I don't know. Well, the first thing we need is we need Naris to decide the name of the pet fish in the office. If Nair's gonna decide on a good fish name, then we'll get a fish tank, and there could be a deep fish tank. We can drop some lights in there. <laughs> Actually, we wanted to have a fish tank here at the booth, but uh, we, we couldn't get one in time, so. Alas, we're just here telling people that it's waterproof. So, um, so we're actually in Amsterdam now. So how's your trip been in Amsterdam today? I love Amsterdam. It's one of the best cities ever. It's actually, it's super beautiful here. You know, coming from the States, when you come here, the second you walk outside just to like, get a bottle of water or something, everything's like too beautiful. Uh, but we actually went on a canal ride and actually dunked this on a boom pole into the water while the boat was moving. And it was actually totally fine and super fun. It was a good time. Wow. So is this out now? This will be out in December. Yeah. December price is about $250. Yeah. Can I touch it? Yes. And in fact, one of the things that I didn't mention already is that you actually have built in effects. So right now I can do a lightning effect. I can do a television effect. And this one's really popular because I know a lot of people use small LEDs to try to mimic that TV glow. Here, so I'll take it off effect mode. And now we are on regular mode, and that's how bright it is. Here, I'll hold the mic and you can live Wow, your, this is uh, awesome. Okay, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do to Ted what he's done to everybody throughout the day. Mm, yes. yes. Let's, let's bump this up a little my, bit. My corneas. My we're going to Yeah, we're going we're gonna oh, to test this. And we're going to test to see how. Oh, it hurts so good. Hurts. Now, don't. I think they, so good. now some movies actually have warnings about this before they show them. Mm -hmm. If you're, uh, epilepsy. Uh, yeah, if you have epilepsy, don't use this product. Are you going to have such a, a similar warning with this product? <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't think until we reach just like Disney levels. <laughs> Did you hear that the Incredibles 2 got like sued for giving people epilepsy? No. Because there's like all those scenes where the screen screensaver like is going crazy. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, no, no Aperture users have sued us yet, so I mean, I, I think until we get sued for epilepsy, we'll see what happens. So, no bright ideas, bright, bright ideas, you get it? <laughs> like that? <laughs> Neris is over there heckling us a little bit. Yep, absolutely. So, what's going on with Aperture as a company, yes. you personally? <laughs> Uh, life is good. As far as the company goes, uh, in Los Angeles, we recently just moved into our new office. So for, you know, for the longest time, I think I've said this a couple times before, but, uh, early, early days of Aperture were literally, we were just working out of a coffee shop and then that was going on for a good two, three years. And then after that, we went into a co-working space, which Naris remembers we were sitting there in the, the bougiest co-working space in Los Angeles. If you guys know about that Neuhaus, mean? Neuhaus is like one of the bougiest co-working spaces in Los Angeles. We were there because there was a deal that uh, if you went there, you could bring 
two guests free every day. So because of that, it was actually cheaper than we work. So we were in this super bougie, bougie co-working space for a while. And then recently uh, we moved into, we had, we had a shared office where we used to share an office with a record label. And then after that, we finally moved in. We have our own little building now in Glendale. We've got a studio that we just built out. Uh, but this is all super recent. So I think when people say Aperture is a new company, I don't think they realize quite how new we are, uh, but it's been a really fantastic experience. Our team has grown a lot. Uh, we now have a, a content team that we're working with regularly. Our marketing team is a lot bigger, and as far as products go, of course, I think we're doing some really exciting stuff. That's really awesome. So are you are you bossing people around now? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm the worst, man. I'm, I'm just yelling all the time. I'm like, where are my donuts and my hot coffee? If my donuts and my hot coffee aren't here at 9 a.m., you're, you're going you're gonna to get it. Nurse is doing whip pants. The, the whip, yeah, absolutely. I have a literal whip in the office. Now, are, are you actually a boss? Uh, yeah, so I manage the Los Angeles office. So how many people do you manage? Uh, there's eight people in our actual office, and then we have a warehouse staff as well, too. So what's your, really, what's your management style? I don't, I don't know. I think everybody at Aperture, to be totally honest, I, I really do mean this. Everybody at Aperture wants to be there. Uh, and, you know, if you don't want to be there, then you don't want to be there. That's it. So I think everybody's pretty self-driven, works by themselves. We've got a super spectacular social media team of people that are working really hard. So to be honest, everyone just pushes themselves by themselves. I don't know, Naris, would you say that's accurate? Everyone pushes themselves? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think everybody's, like, super motivated. There is, and I say this a lot, but... Uh, it's kind of the best of both worlds in that we are a new company. We have that kind of startup kick and you can feel that energy in the office all the time of like we're doing something new. We're doing something exciting. We're breaking some rules. Uh, and then at the same time, though, we've got we've got the same kind of man manufacturing umph and like the warehouse umph of uh, and like the support that I think a bigger brand would be able to have. So it's a good combination. This is really cool. So I have a couple Aperture products. Yes. I got the big one yep. of the the, the 300, mm -hmm. which I love. I used it to <clears throat> light up a space recently where there's a lot of windows in the background. Yeah. And it was really easy to use and super powerful. So I love the, the quick setup. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'll, I'll pay you for saying that. <laughs> if you say that one more time a little bit slower, let me get my phone out to record it. I'm glad to hear it. So how did you hear about Aperture in the first place? So you used the GigaTube. I had the GigaTube. Let's talk about the GigaTube for a while. No, let's so I got the gig. I got the GigaTube about ten, <laughs> ten years ago. Yep, the GigaTube. It's about yep. this big. And yep. recently, when I was reorganizing my office, I found it. Yep. It was stuffed tell under something. Your, tell me about your office. What does your office look like? I think Veronica could tell me about the office. Ver no, but Veronica's not on camera right now. And Veronica, she's she's pantomiming. So you're you're unfortunately alone in terms of telling us what your office looks like. My office is like an arche archaeological site. There are levels Ooh. of of of, that, uh, hence the GigaTube, a fossil of its time, a, 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 a buried skeleton of, of an aperture that once was. Yes, absolutely. Yes, there, there are piles of things at different levels, and usually my, the latest used stuff is on top. Yeah. How about your office? Our office, well, we just moved in, so it's actually pretty clean. How about your desk? How about my desk? <laughs> Actually, my desk isn't that dirty. I, I think my desk isn't that dirty. This is the kind of thing that you don't really have a lot of perspective on until somebody else comes over and is like, wow, it's really messy here. So You don't want it to be, it to be too neat, yet, though, you know. Yeah, you know why. Too neat. Well, the problem is that we just moved in, so I think everything's a little too neat, to be, to be totally honest. Just to give it a few weeks. Yeah. <laughs> well, so what are you doing um, creatively? Creatively. So right now we are working on the new products. Uh, we just had our product release. So basically we had five new light shaping accessories come out. Uh, light Dome 2, Light Dome Mini 2, the barn doors came out, uh, the new Aperture Chimera light bank, which that was that was a creative collaboration process with Chimera themselves. And then we also had the Easy Box 2 come out. So we've been working on new products. Uh, but with each product, of course, there's like a marketing campaign that we got to do. So if you guys saw the commercial, if you saw any of the new content that's been coming out, it's really like a whole team endeavor in terms of we'll sit down and make a list of all the videos we have to make and then the commercial of course is uh is a behemoth people don't realize that we actually make all of our own videos and commercials in-house so at least with the past few commercials with the light shaping accessories and with the 120d mark ii we are literally sitting there like it is uh it's like Mission Impossible or something. We're like there, all, like up until the line, getting the content ready because a lot of the time we don't have a prototype that we can shoot until just a couple of weeks before release. So the commercial process is always something that we have to do really quickly and in-house and fast. So, so who's the director? Who's the DP? Yeah. Who's the production designer, et cetera? Well, it's it's a team effort for sure. Absolutely, I think uh, the footage gets shot literally all over the world. 
So what I can say is that uh, we've got like this incredible robo shooter that shoots all the fashion videos for Vogue in New York. And he just, he's, he's like you, he, he had one of the first ever Aperture v, VS1 monitors from like seven years ago. And when we were a tiny like 10 by 10 booth at NAB, I remember he found us in the way back corner and was like, I love your monitor. I shoot with all these big budget things, but your monitor has better like any reflective coating than the TV logic that I'm using. And since then, he's been sort of just someone that we've kept in touch with a long time. Uh, so he will actually shoot all the robo footage of all the products, but he's shooting that in Manhattan. Uh, Levi Allen we worked with on this time. He's sort of like a YouTube guy that we work with. He shot all the footage in Vancouver of like the guy and the girl traveling with the gear. Um, there's footage that was shot. We shot all the, like the manufacturing, like factory footage too, everything that's getting made. So like literally all the footage, and we shoot stuff in-house as well too. So it's not, um, certainly we're not like flying around the world to shoot this stuff. It's a team effort, which I think kind of makes sense because it's sort of the way that the company runs in the first place. It's, you know, what is the gear that people want? With the internet, people can tell us what they want just like that. And it's just our decision now to try to make it and be able to meet what they want. Well, as I said in the last couple interviews, we could talk forever. I think the last interv interview we were actually, you would, Neris was, was closing the booth down. He was actually packing stuff and we were, it, we were like bent over. So Neris, tell us about this, and he was packing stuff up. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Well, if you'd like, I can walk through the new light if you're interested in that. <laughs> or we can just do a lifestyle, you know, talk about, so how's life for you? How are you sleeping? How's your relationship with your mother? Sleep, uh, the sleeping's not too great. The mother relationship's okay. Is, is okay. That's good. How about yours? Relationship with the mother. <laughs> Well, I will say, uh, so, so my mother's in Baltimore. So I live in Los Angeles, my mother's in Baltimore. So it's very hard to keep in touch regularly, you know, but um, also she doesn't understand technical things like, you know, like lights and CRI. So I'm like, no, Ma, it's got a TLCI of 97. And she's like, oh, cool. And I'm like, you don't understand, Mom. It's really high. And she's like, <laughs> whatever makes you happy, Ted. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, relationship should be, could be better. If my mom knew more about technical things like <laughs> TLCI readings or CRI readings. But you know, I can't really complain, you know? I can't really complain about that kind of thing. Uh, okay, I think we're going to have to end this interview. <laughs> we're starting to talk about subjects that are... Do you want to come in near us just to make a yeah, little appearance? Nervous. How's your relationship with your mother? <laughs> my mother? Yes. My mother, mm -hmm. uh, it's great. It's fantastic. Ooh. We get lunch every Sunday. Ooh. Uh, really? Yeah. What? My goodness, uh, goals. We get lunch goals. every Sunday. She lives down the street, so it's fine. Yeah. Uh, but it's just far away enough that mm -hmm. you know we still get along well. Uh, <laughs> she doesn't know anything about lights either, yeah. Um, yeah. but she knows that they're yeah. cool and yeah. that I like my job. <laughs> so, of yeah. either of your mothers, which one knows what would know more about what CRI means? Your mother. If you're seeing her every Sunday, you, there's like it's like class every every Sunday. You get to teach a couple of things. <laughs> Eventually, like, we come up with an aperture light that's like TLC ICRI 94, and your mother's like, Nerys, only 94? Only 94? Isn't, isn't that Nerys, that's good, low. but not, not too good kind of thing? That's not good enough, Nerys. Probably your mother. I mean, I don't know. I don't think either I've, of I've our mothers. I've never met your mother, though, so. <laughs> yeah. How's your mother know about TLC ICRI? She would, she would know what CRI means. I think this applies to a lot of gear nerds out there. It's a very lonely, sad existence of just geeking out about things that nobody understands. I think that's why these trade shows are as populated as they are. It's like people just have it built up in them, this like need to geek out about the nerdiest things. And then they come here and they're met with that enthusiasm, you know? They get to express themselves, yeah. their true selves. Yeah, like uh, Mike Ashman from Small HD came by uh, and literally we just sat there and just, like, <laughs> he just he talked for a solid 10 minutes about the monitor. And I was like, man, how many places in the world could you speak this in depth about false color, customizable false color? And, really and we were loving it. We were loving color. it. We were like, ooh, didn't even know I wanted that. That was amazing. How did you build that? So uh, yeah, it makes a lot of sense actually. Yeah. Get to be our true selves here. Yeah. I mean, I can already tell like, cause it's a mix, you know, you have like personal people at home that don't know anything about lights, but still, or friends with you on Facebook or sure, something like sure. that. So like when, when we do like rants on social media about like lighting or like new tech, I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of people that are at home like, well, nurse is really passionate about this thing. 
I guess I'm happy for him. He really likes Rembrandt lighting. Really likes My friends always make fun of me thing. for how much I love Rembrandt lighting. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's going on. So that's new. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we have to go. So. <laughs> Neo Amaran MW helps you talk to your mom about lighting. It's a stepping stone for bigger and better things. And when our bigger RGB light that comes out behind us that we didn't talk about yet, by the way, there's an RGB light coming out. It's going to be about $1,500 and it's going to be out in March, which is super exciting because we think it's the first time that people can own RGB. Sales pitch out. This kind of light would be able to uh, help you discuss uh, the, the finer details of lighting with your mother before the big light comes out in March. Great idea. Right before Mother's Day, it'll be available in April. The MW for mom. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ted and Neris. We're here at uh, IBC. I actually forgot what the show was called for a second. IBC 2018. And uh, maybe TMI, not sure, but it's okay. Um, signing off for Tech Move. That's Tech Move's Keith Moreau reporting on the showroom floor of IBC 2018 with the folks over at Aperture. Uh, specifically Ted Sim and Neris Nasarian. That MW light, I got to say, I was quite impressed with looking at it. Keith, uh, your thoughts from uh, maybe that light versus other lights? Uh, w your thoughts? Uh, very small, very portable, very bright, and seems to last a long time according to their specs. About an hour and a half it sounded like, huh? Yeah. So, you know, throw it in your bag. Uh, use it as a little extra light to light up a background, shine in somebody's eyes and blind them. Um, yeah, very, very versatile light. And it's waterproof, so you could potentially just put it on a set out in the rain if you want to uh, add some extra lighting. So, yeah, I like the light. I uh, really liked just interviewing the guy, talking about um, their personal lives and <laughs> the company. Yeah. Um, it was actually pretty, a really fun interview. It's always fun. We always just get kind of crazy and... Uh, really like both those guys it's 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 really good when we can you know kind of uh, sometimes get that rapport with some of our past uh interview ease mm -hmm. and uh re really get past some of the just the you know constant pushing of the product and really hear about you know s some of their insights their backgrounds and stuff like that so that's always good yeah yeah, they, they actually even mentioned that during the interview. They say, this is like the best interview ever because, you know, we're always talking, we're always saying the same thing over and over again about oh, yeah. our products and you come in and we actually get to talk about other stuff. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. Well, the, and, and you know what? The neat thing, too, is that they actually have great products to, to you know, really talk about. So it mm -hmm. makes you want to talk to them. And that's why we always keep going to them over and over and over again. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and they always come out with with neat stuff. Yeah, there's, you um, know, I, I like to, I like to, I like to focus on companies that I feel like are game changers. Y you know, if you look at these different interviews that we, that, that we've conducted, these are companies that are not that, they're not that old. I mean, there's maybe a few years old, like we did, um, you know, several of the others in this, in this, um, in this episode. Right. And there's kind of a, a certain energy to them because of that. Yeah. Um, and, and they're always kind of. Um, they're always on the bleeding edge of things, coming out with things that are breaking price points as well as quality, you know, changing the game. And Aperture is, is one of those companies. They're, they've changed the game of lighting. I well, I, I, and, and, and I like them too because they've been in the game for a little while too. Yeah, they've been in the game uh, as a lighting company though, maybe less than five years. Sure. And, and uh, just very, very innovative innovative and um breaking price barriers all over the place <laughs> but you know what funny you mention that because you know when you say that in the lighting game for five years uh, that's actually an eternity so, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that, that's like saying they've been doing it since like uh, uh 1936 or something <laughs> like that so being in the lighting game for five years is an eternity so that that that, that puts them Head and shoulders of uh, everyone else. So, <laughs> congratulations to Aperture on that. So, good, yeah, good, good stuff. All right, that is uh, uh, the folks over at Aperture, along with the folks over here at Tech Move, and we're going to take a quick break and come back with more 
IBC 2018 right here on Techno. All right, we're back with more of IBC 2018. And uh, now let's move on to uh, a couple other favorite things that, that we like, uh, uh, folks we like talking to. And that's the folks over at Black Magic Design. Uh, Keith, you had the great pleasure of uh, visiting their booth and seeing what kind of new cool things uh, are in store at Black Magic. And uh, we were able to catch up with a gentleman by the name of Craig Heffernan, or Hefferman, I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's Cra- Heffernan. 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 Okay, uh-huh. he- yeah. great. And uh, Craig was available to us. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, again, it was something where it looked, Keith, like you were able to have some pretty good access to to these folks. It wasn't. Uh, it, it wasn't as crazy as. Uh, may, maybe NAB would be, or or maybe early on in the shows. It seems like you're pretty uh, uh, able to get to them quickly. Yeah, it was it was great. I, I usually just go up to the booth uh, and just ask somebody I want to interview and talk about this product. Who do I talk to? And the guy, they, somebody, one of the representatives uh, pointed out Craig and said that guy right there. Um, just talk to him. He's the guy that usually gives the interviews. So went over to him. Liked him immediately. Very personable guy. He's actually from uh, from the uh, from England. So since I was going to England, we made a little small talk about about that, about London and stuff like that. So um, he he was a really nice person, and I uh, really enjoyed uh, doing the interview with him. Great. So uh, you know, I know that he is about to introduce uh, a couple of new things that Black Magic Design has going on. So uh, mm-hmm. why don't we get to that interview and then we'll come back with some comments? How about that? Sounds good. Fantastic. Okay, here's Craig Heffernan uh, from Black Magic Design with our own Keith Moreau right here on Techno. Hi, Keith Moreau here, IBC 2018. We're here at the Black Magic Design booth with Craig. He's going to go over a couple new developments with his company. Hi, Keith. How are you doing? So what we've been talking about at IBC 2018 is the imminent release of the Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. So this product was announced at NAB. A load of information online at blackmagicdesign.com about the technical features and the capability of the camera. But in essence, a micro four-thirds based camera with a four-thirds sensor, 13 stops of range, internal raw recording and a brand new dual ISO recording system which we're really excited about introducing. This product will be out in the hands of customers in the coming weeks and we're really looking forward to seeing what people do with it. Aside from Pocket Cinema Camera, we're also talking about the new Blackmagic RAW uh, compressed RAW codec that's available. So this is a public beta that's gone into our Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K camera. Owners of that camera can go and download the new version 6 software and update it, try out this new format for themselves, and then take that through to the new DaVinci Resolve 15.1 software update that will support the, the new format as well. And what's key with this is we've approached the way that we work with raw formats in an entirely new and revolutionary way. There's um, some technical changes the way we work in camera by doing a partial demosaic. We're adding video profile information into the file as we record in the camera, which means we have a really adaptive and fast system for color choices in DaVinci Resolve After. And also we have a brand new compressed RAW format that's behaving uh, differently inside the camera based on the sensor profiling and a completely new compression system. So we're getting file sizes that are equivalent, say, 4K ProRes file but as a 12-bit RAW file. So they're editable, they're gradable, and you've got this fantastic workflow from camera all the way through to post. So we've been demoing that, showing people how they can get into RAW workflows without having to deal with really big file sizes or really knowing how to sort of break down that RAW workflow in post-production as well. Right now, that's uh, something specific to certain cameras? It is right now just in Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K. We are gonna bring it to the Pocket Cinema Camera 4K in due course. Uh, This product needs to ship first. We need to move the new codec out of public beta to make sure that's fixed and ready, and then we'll introduce it into this this camera. And then in a few months' time, we'll have some more information about where we're going to go with future hardware and what what comes next for Blackmagic RAW. Do you think you're going to eventually release it to all your all your cameras, or are you going to maybe hold off on a few, or any plans on? To be confirmed, to be honest, there may be some cameras that are slightly too old, have been around in the market, still very good in terms of what they offer out the box, but possibly not sort of powerful enough to internally process the Blackmagic RAW codec as we need to, but we'll give some more information as a sort of definite list of what we'll do with those products. 
Sounds good. Back, back to this uh, particular unit. I held the prototype a few months ago, yep. and I noticed this is quite a bit lighter than the prototype. Well, absolutely. So the ones we showed at NAB as a prototype model and to introduce the new camera were made out of a more traditional um, aluminium uh, metalwork that we've used on the other cameras. This is actually a polycarbonate fiber system, so the weight of the camera is around about 720 grams. It's incredibly lightweight. I mean, in, in the hand as well, it's stable. Uh, the most weight I've got here is the glass. So it's nice for me to sort of handle and move it around. So it's, it's going to feel really good for people. Nice and light for small handheld gimbals as well. Uh, tell me about the difference between the SD card capabilities and the CFast card capabilities in this camera. Okay, so the recording options is you do have the dual card format system. So you could put in an SD card. That's going to be ideal for HD and some of the lower data rate 4K options. The camera does recall raw, in, raw internally, 13 stops of latitude protected in a cinema DNG raw format. But that's where you're going to need to step up, say, a CFAST card. So we've got the data rates. So you can record those files and make sure that they're all protected, recorded correctly, no drop frames, and take through to post. The other option you do have on the camera, though, which is unique to this particular camera, is a USB-C port on the side. And that means you can attach external storage over USB-C, record directly to flash drives or SSD drives. And the benefit there is you can actually plug that USB drive straight into post-production, say into DaVinci Resolve, and work straight off the media you recorded in the camera. So you've actually got three recording options built into the camera right now. Do you have the ability to record on the SD and the CFast and output at the same time, do proxies, things like that for backups? No, it's a single process channel. So it's one media type, one format at any time. So the choice would be internally between SD or the CFAST card. And then if you are using external and you plug a USB-C in, what will actually happen in the menu structure, you'll see one of the options change to recognize USB-Cs available, and it will lock out one of the other areas. So it's, it's one format into one media type at any time. I see. Well, it looks it's a very exciting camera. Um, I probably will get one simply because you have this really high recording codec available, which really isn't available in most other small cameras like this. No, definitely. It's unique in that way. And this is something we've always said about our cinema products and the cameras that we put out for cinematic and, and filmmaking professionals, is we have great sense technology. We're very proud of the new generation for color science that's gone into this product. But we also want to retain that. So we've always had raw in the cameras. Right now, it's cinema DNG raw. So it's the same raw formats we've had throughout the range of our cameras to date. Um, and as I said, though, we'll look to bring Blackmagic Roar into the camera in the future. Well, that's great. We have, this is amazing stuff. You, you guys are doing some groundbreaking things with regard to quality and, and price points. I can't wait for this to come out and, and for the raw format to be available. No, we're looking forward to see what people do with it, get some feedback, and just strive to keep improving the products for people. Thanks so much. Keith Moreau signing off for TechMove. That's Craig Heffernan from Blackmagic Design uh, with Keith Moreau. Keith, uh, the big announcement, a couple of things there uh, that I got from, of course, the Pocket Cinema 4K and the Blackmagic Raw Compression Codec. Um, give me your thoughts uh, after seeing them both and uh, you had a little time to think about it. What did you think? Um, the camera actually, like it, even better than when I saw it a few months ago. Uh, the camera, I think, the one I was holding was a, a like a final model, so it was actually quite a bit lighter. I think the body's made out of some type of plastic, um, or I don't, I'm not positive if it's plastic or not, but it seemed a lot lighter. So, um, but it still seemed well made. It didn't seem cheap. It seemed very solid. Um, and I think, and I hope they come out soon because I think it's going to be awesome. I think it's an amazing little camera if it can really deliver on on what the specs are and what what, what do you think um I, I didn't hear if there was a price point on, on the camera or not I, I i didn't catch it maybe i had uh uh stepped away or was there any price point for the camera yeah yeah i think it's going gonna be like 14.95 okay All no right. no 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 actually less 12.95 about twelve ninety five for something yeah, like which that. Yeah, which is which is amazing. Is, is that something you might want to try? I think I'll get it because I think it's it's a good, you know, high quality like C camera mm -hmm. for if I really really need to have 
something that I could grade a lot. Yeah. And and just and or set it, set it up and forget it. Mm-hmm. Um, simply because of just the codec, um, the high quality codecs that it records in. Mm-hmm. You know, it can record in RAW. I don't know if I'd use RAW with it or not. I could. Um, and could record different varieties of ProRes. And uh, just having that, and, and the thing that's cool is you can plug in a USB 3 uh, drive to it and actually just have it recording on the drive. So you could have a really huge USB drive just hanging off of it and just set it and forget it, you know, with a power supply or something. Set it and forget it. and um, Kind of better than those other recorders that are out there, right? I mean, a little bit less cumbersome USB 3 is so available to everybody. Yeah, and the fact the fact is, you just need a drive. You, all you need is a USB three drive, and then it's spitting out the data to the to the drive, and then you could take that drive and then edit with it. You don't even need to copy it to anything necessarily to edit. So, and there's there's a lot of really really inexpensive SSDs uh, that are out there now. Yeah, that, that with you, bigger you just capacity plug. too. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So I'm pretty excited about that, and um, you know, I think it's a good. For thirteen hundred dollars, it's it's basically hardly anything, you know, yeah. for this type of camera. Yeah. Um, it's not going to be the kind of camera necessarily that you would like, maybe want to run and gun with. I have a feeling like it's going to be a bit limited in that regard because there's a big big back screen, but um, it's it you might not be able to run and gun with it just because of focusing and and other issues that you might need to you know have some external stuff hanging off of it and then when, at that point it starts getting kind of big um also i don't think it has built-in nds um which is not necessarily a um you know a deal breaker but just compare it compare this camera to the gh5 okay yep um gh5 doesn't record raw it doesn't record ProRes. has a pretty high bit rate 400 megabits this has you know way higher bit rates way higher bit depths um GH5 has 10 bit. This has probably 12 bit if you go in raw, um, and has the ability to off off load record really easily. Has a built in huge screen, which is great. Not sure how great it is in light. That's that's an issue. Uh, sunlight might be an issue. Might wash it out. But still, just as a kind of a crash cam, or a set it and forget it cam, or a a C cam. You know, maybe like a wide shot with really super high resolution and dynamic range that you don't necessarily want to mess with, which I use GH4s and GH5s for all the time. Um, pretty inexpensive little rig. Well, and let's face it, I uh, by the looks of it, a uh, much smaller body. Um, than what? Than like a GH4, GH5. Actually, well, no, the body is pretty comparable in fact maybe slightly bulkier is that right it, it, yeah it just from the video that i saw it looked like it, a little bit smaller in the hand than than my gh4 your gh5 um it might it might be a little deceiving it's actually really? a little bit okay. bigger yeah it's a little bit bigger right. um imagine your your five inch iphone spread across the back of a camera that's mm-hmm. about that's about how big that thing is it's a little bit wider mm. um and you know, look at that lens that's on there. That's like a typical Panasonic lens, and see how how small that lens is. Yeah, on the camera. So that kind of gives you an idea of it. It's not it's not huge. It's just about the same size as a GH five, okay. maybe slightly wider, maybe so, a little. So really, so really, let, because that was one of the big things I was thinking about. Is that why not just use a GH four, GH five for your mm-hmm. you know for your C roll, uh, you know for four K. But I mm-hmm. think you pretty much said it right there. The codex, the ability to uh, to work with post uh, from it is is maybe a little bit better than what we, we can get from the the Panasonic stuff. Yeah, I think the ability to work in post it's more versatile um, if that's what you want to do. So I kind of see this maybe not so much for peop- the GH five market, but maybe more for higher end productions that need crash cams. Mm-hmm. They need to have a super high-end cam that's only running for 10 seconds until it gets gets run over. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. In fact, uh, Craig mentioned to me, I don't think he mentioned to me in the interview, but offline, he talked about he was actually um, one of the people that helped um, set up a lot of the crash cams for the um, for the Avengers 2 movie. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, he even mentioned a few scenes that he set up, and they had they didn't. This camera wasn't out then, um, but they had the kind of previous uh, version of this. It was the 
I believe it was the HD version. Mm-hmm. Um, and they set it the the pocket uh, the pocket cinema cam, and they set these up all over because they were so cheap. They're like thousand dollars or less. They could they could uh, afford to have them destroyed, but still capture these amazing mm-hmm. lar- uh, high bit rate files. And as long as they could recover, you know, extract that, <laughs> yeah, start the card out. <laughs> And and use that later, then it was it was worth it. And that those that type of camera cut in to a big production like Avengers. Can you imagine that being done with a GH five? Yeah, it's true. You know, they probably not, probably not. So yeah, so I see this being used a lot for for big production as a kind of a throwaway cam. Mm. Well, so, I guess yeah. their uh, their production department better get cracking on uh, <laughs> spitting those babies out as uh, as as fast as uh, they can because uh, you know I know Tech Move is going to be ordering about ten of them just to throw <laughs> off the balcony here. And, pretty pretty uh, much, yeah. yeah. No, that's yeah, it's that's great. Yeah. And it's going to have you know built-in crumple zones for low injury. <laughs> well, let, let, <laughs> let's talk real quickly about the codec. Uh, oh the, yeah, the new yeah. the the new Blackmagic raw compression. Yes, uh, give me a little sense of that. What your what your thoughts are? My thoughts are it's a really awesome way to sell Blackmagic cameras. <laughs> okay. It is okay. It's it's brilliant. Yeah. Um, it, it, it sounds like it's going to be adopted by by a, a, a lot of uh, a, a lot of other companies out there uh, being able to to work with it. Uh, uh, post production wise and and stuff like that, you know, can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Well, it's it's supposedly an, a really good codec. It supposedly rivals or maybe even surpasses the portability and 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 ease of use of of ProRes RAW, which is kind of kind of a similar vein. It's just a RAW format that's compressed somehow to make it smaller and more easy to use. Um, so, but um. Right now, the only thing that can record it are Blackmagic cameras, and and specifically the only one that can actually record it now is the is the Ursa Mini Pro, which is the very newest um, and biggest um, Blackmagic camera. Mm-hmm. So none of the other Blackmagic cameras uh, can use it. For example, this camera we just talked about, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, can't can't uh, record in in RAW in the Blackmagic RAW. Um, the even my um, older Ursa Mini can't record in Blackmagic and, and may never be able to. Although I'd love for them to make a firmware upgrade to that, but I kind of feel like that camera is like seen its days. It's probably, probably not going to spend the time. But you never know. Maybe. Yeah. Um, I think it requires a bit of processing power, so maybe some cameras just can't do it. So, so you don't even think the new Pocket Cinema 4K that that uh, uh, they had just demonstrated to us that will not be able to use this uh, this new compression? You know, they're they're being very uh, closed lipped about it. Uh, so they're them. testing it. They they want it to. They just they, they just haven't gotten there yet. They're 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 working on it. I, I to be honest with you, I feel like if it was easy to do, it would have been in there because uh, like like if the processor that was in this little camera yeah. was capable enough they would have just automatically put it in there yeah it's going to be in there because they would be able to sell a lot more of those cameras easily right because it's got this great compressed codec uses less space it's still really high quality and it's this cheap camera why not right but right now i think they i think there's some limitations because it requires the camera's processor um to be pretty powerful to to encode that that raw file hmm um, it's some kind of strange way that they're encoding because you know um, I think Red has a has a patent on compressed raw, and so everybody that else that has compressed raw has to cleverly work around that patent, and so they do something kind of strange in the camera, like they compress part of it but not another part because they don't infringe on the patent. I think that's what's going on. So um, it's a strange hybrid way that they compress. It's not it's not straightforward. So um, Anyway, maybe that's what causes more causes more processing power to be used. But anyway, yeah, it's really cool. Um, obviously, it works in Resolve. It's also to sell Resolve or you know more more hardware get Resolve to be more popular. It's hopefully going to be supported in Final Cut and in uh, Premiere. Um, I would assume Premiere will do it right away. I think maybe Apple won't like it because it competes with their RAW. But yeah, we'll see. Excellent. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. Well. Uh, that is uh, Craig Heffernan, 
uh, from Black Magic Design and uh, Keith Moreau. Thanks, Keith, for yep. finding Craig and yep. uh, getting him to show us all this great stuff. And uh, we're we're excited to to kind of see how the Pocket Cinema 4K camera is gonna gonna look in your hands, mm-hmm. and uh, and then we'll we'll stay tuned as far as the the new Black Magic Raw uh, codec uh, and how widely used it can be and who can use it. So that'll be, mm-hmm. that'll be exciting to, to see. All right. Yeah. Um, we're going to take a quick little break and come back with more coverage of IBC 2018. As we often do, it is Rod Louis Keith Moreau right here on Tech Mode. So, ladies and gentlemen, we want to introduce to you a new kind of topic segment. I don't know. We we might turn it into a segment uh, <laughs> only because this seems to happen quite often. Yes. And, we, and we've we tentatively titled this segment, Why is Something Always Missing? <laughs> and, Keith, you know, it brings to mind something that you've wanted to talk about and something that I've thought about. Uh, like the differences between the GH5 and the GH5S, this is one of those perfect little things that we can uh, uh, use to illustrate, I think, in this segment, why is something always missing? Keith, go ahead and uh, <laughs> y- you share with us your thoughts on, 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 on why something's always got to be missing. You know, I personally think that it's a business decision by companies. I agree. It's all think, about the dollar. I, it's I think all it's a, about I the th- dollar. It's kind of like f- when you, when when something doesn't make sense, follow the money. Yeah. <laughs> you know, something's happening saying, like, "Hmm, why why is that happening?" Follow the money. That's always that's yeah. always the last common denominator. It's a little cynical, but and it makes sense. It makes sense. You know, these companies are in business to make money. They have to they have to protect their, you know, upper ends. And and sometimes you need disruptors like Blackmagic Design or or uh, other other companies um, that are coming out with with you know groundbreaking cameras to introduce things at lower price points that maybe do have everything, but they really don't. Um, for I'll give you an example, uh, Panasonic GH5 GH5S. Yep, kind of awesome cameras. They're, Great they're, cameras. Yeah, they're micro four thirds. Okay, so they don't have full frame, but that's okay. We'll we'll give them a pass on that. Um, but they've got so many good things: good codecs. They've got um, good dynamic, pretty good dynamic range. Now nowadays they're getting better color, good resolution, more than four K resolution in some cases. Um, but what don't they have that bugs me? They don't have punch in focus while you're while you're actually recording. You know, sometimes you need when you're actually recording, you need to check to see if you're actually in focus, right? Because there's all these other focus aids that aren't 100% reliable. There's peaking, right? Peaking in the old days, you know, all, all cameras have it. It's basically makes a little outline around things that are in, in focus in a different color, but the outline can be thin or thick. Uh, if it's really, really thick, then it's probably in focus. But how how thick? is thick. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. You know, things like that. And, I mean, and I mean the, you know, I'm experiencing that myself with the, the GH4, right? When yeah. I when I first got the thing and then you see the, all the little blue lines. And yeah. I said, what the heck is that thing? Huh? <laughs> and I said, oh, wait a minute. Oh, that's that means I'm actually in focus, which <laughs> means that I can't really see it, but yet I'm in focus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, and so the Sonys have this. You know, the the Sony A series cameras have this. You can punch in a lot, and you can see if you're actually in focus, and then you can gently move it into focus if you're not. Um, Which is a great really, feature. Great yeah, feature. Yeah, can't can't do that with the GH series. Maybe some new versions will have it. But then, like, who was thinking? Who was who was making this stuff up when they were designing the GH camera? I think I think it's a technical limit limitation in the case of the Panasonic's. I personally feel like. If Panasonic could put that in, they actually would. But I feel like their engineering or whatever just didn't think it was uh, important enough to sacrifice other things or increase the cost. But that's the one thing that's missing. Okay, and then conversely, on the the A7s and and you know the twos, the threes, and whatever they're going to come out with, 
they don't have 10 bit onboard recording. You know, you, you can record in log, which is great. The log is awesome, but you have to be really still very, very careful with your exposure or it's going to get all bandy. Mm -hmm. So, and the GH series, GH5s have the 10 bit recording, but the Sony's don't. You know, right. so <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Well, I I have one to throw out at you as far as GH five and GH five S. How about something like Ibis? Yes, yes, right, exactly. I, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Ibis comes out on the five, mm -hmm. groundbreaking, right? Fabulous. Yes. I mean, oh my gosh, this is going to be great. You know, next to the Sony A sixty five hundred. Oh, this is going to be great, Ibis. All this kind of mm -hmm. thing. And then, like, you know, a week and a half later, the 5S comes out. But you know what? We can't have it in there, though. That no. We got to save that for the 6S later on. Right, right. So now you're now you have relegated to using, you know, the, the lenses that are stabilized if you're doing handheld. And there's a limited selection of stabilized lenses, you know. And, and I want to use a prime lens. I don't want to use a, a stabilized zoom lens for... for in shots. I want it to be the super best quality, but I can't can't really do it hand held unless I have some type of stabilizing rig on it. <clears throat> so because you get all these little micro jitters, and, right? And so yeah, so yeah. Again, like why can't we have everything? Another example of IBIS is I have a Canon C two hundred. It's awesome. It's not that big. It records in RAW if I need it to. It records in a nice um, eight bit codec if I need to. But it doesn't have ten bit bit. Um, uh, compressed codec. It just has raw. So I'm, I'm relegated to this really nice looking but still limited in post 8-bit recording or the super huge raw format. Um, I can't get something in the middle like a 10-bit internal recording like the C300 um, Mark II has. And it doesn't have IBIS. So now I still have, it's the same issue with the GH5S. I still have to use stabilized lenses on it if I want to do <laughs> handheld. You know? And it's just like if some company came out with just those three things in one camera, they would just destroy all the other companies. Come on, let's do it. You, you, you know, <laughs> you know what I would love to. You know what I think is really happening is that there is some uh, all these companies: Panasonic, Sony, Canon, Nikon, Fuji. They all have their conference rooms loaded up with uh, their you know grease boards. They have all the same technology, and they're just saying, you know what, we'll put it on this one, but we won't put it on that one. They could do it. They just yeah. don't want to. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I, it, and that's protecting their, their upper line. So And, 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 it, it, and, and, and building for, towards the future, too, right? For, building for to the, the next future. Model. Yeah, it's kind of like making, planning a series of movies or something. And not putting everything into the first movie. Yeah, you say saving a little bit for the second and third movie because you want to have people wanting more. So the free is the famous cliffhanger, right? Will the <laughs> yeah. next one have it? Yes, yes, and and so let's just let's just get it on the table. Just one of you guys come out with something that everybody's going to buy, and it won't matter if you need to protect your upper line or your lower lower line or whatever. You're going to sell so many of these things that you're going to make so much money that it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, you know, we, we and and you know, those of us here at Tech Move, we put the challenge out there to <laughs> all the manufacturers because, you know, our voice is so loud and bright that we know that they will be having emergency shareholder meetings right now once they yeah, hear I, this segment. The, and, yeah, um, the boards are lighting up. The shareholders right. are demanding. <laughs> Did you hear the Tech Move segment? <laughs> well, uh Folks, we, we want to hear your opinion, too. And, uh, you know, if you can, you know, write us a little comment on the website, uh, techmovepodcast.com. Uh, you know, send us an email somewhere. I don't, I don't know. Uh, Keith, how, how else can they get hold of us to kind of share their opinions with us on, uh, on what uh, folks out there are disgusted with as, as much as we are? <laughs> I think they could actually send emails to info at techmovepodcast.com. They could also Twitter us ah. at techmovepodcast. They could, That's they for could the even, kids, isn't it? That's for the kids, the Twittering and stuff Twitter, like that, right? Uh, some adults use it. And then for the kids, probably Instagram. We have an Instagram, techmovepodcast on Instagram. So we're out there. 
so, we're out there. There's so many ways to contact us. So we'd uh, we love, have, yeah, we would love to hear what you think about what we are just complaining about just now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm going to start a forum on it. That's right. Let, let, let's, let's get this string going. Uh, all right. So um, thank you very much, Keith. Um, yep. I'm going to go and get into my yoga stance and calm myself down from uh, <laughs> from all this uh, nonsense that's going on. And uh, in the meantime, we will come back with more on Tech Move. Well, that concludes our coverage of 2018's IBC show. And uh, Keith, thanks so much for uh, grabbing all those uh, great friends of the show, yep. and um, and really forcing them to to speak with us about all the uh, new gear and products that they have going. Uh, there, there's quite a few things out there. Yeah, there are quite a few things. Um, I think that several things were announced, kind of like after the show, like right after the show, or they were just kind of new, or they were maybe just not there. Um, like for example, I went to the DJI booth and I looked at the, you know, pretty much just looked at the, uh, Mavic, um, two pro and talked to the guy a little bit about it. Um, but I didn't record them. And the reason I didn't was I wanted to, but they didn't have any press people there that, that were authorized to talk. Oh, how so, interesting. Is that right? Yeah. You mean they just had people there to just kind of show it off and stuff like yeah. that. And, yeah. but nobody there to talk, no product managers, nothing like that available. I guess. Yeah, I guess not. Or oh. maybe they just looked at the iPad and just went, uh, "We're just going to blow this guy off. <laughs> we're not going to, we're not going to record with this rinky dink organization." <laughs> but don't and, they know and, they're with the ever powerful <laughs> tech move? I mean, come on now, you know, gee maybe, whiz. Maybe. I, I mean, we have some footage on them that's not flattering. So here we go. <laughs> I, uh, oh, actually, a little callback. I forgot to mention in the tech of tech move um, live recording. Yes. That we have this kind of interesting um, iPad setup. Okay, so we used to just put the iPad onto a monopod. Right. And it was actually, that was okay because the monopod's pretty easy to carry around. It's small and it kind of relieves the strain a little bit. Like we didn't even used to have a monopod. It, Veronica just used to hold the iPad. Right. Actually, yeah. And holding the iPad up kind of at, you know, chest high for oh, that can be difficult. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Especially yeah. as long as we get sometimes. Like, so yeah, yeah, exactly. So her arms were were dying by the end. Sure. So I think the next time we got, I got a little clamp for the iPad. I actually had it. I just repurposed it and put it on top of the the monopod, and that was okay. But it was still kind of strenuous to have to kind of keep the monopod from falling over. Right. And it, and it was also just kind of stressful because you couldn't just leave it. You just had to always hold it. And so that was also a little bit strenuous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then uh, I think the next year we started using a small tripod and, and the tripod was good, but it didn't get quite high enough. The monopods actually go higher than tripods usually. Yes. Large monopods. So Correct. it was kind of, it was always at like chest high. So you had this a little bit, you know, weird perspective. Right. On the interviews should be about head high usually. And um, so then the next time we brought this real, I got this really, really fancy, iPhone uh, selfie stick and you know how you can get really cheap ones that are you know like little piece of metal that you just bend in half and yep. this one is a super it's got like these cam locks on it and it goes really long it's probably like you know 13 inches or 14 inches long anyway when it's right. really collapsed so it's pretty big right and uh, at the bottom of it I put a quick release on it that goes into the tripod so then we keep the tripod lower so we don't expand it all the way. So it's a little bit lower footprint, but it's mm -hmm. still stable, you know, so it's not super spread out and that's good because then people won't trip, trip over it. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And then we just extend up this, this little selfie stick, which is basically like a monopod, just that it's attached to the top of the tripod head and just extend it up as high or low as we want. And we can just easily, she can just easily move that around. So that's our fancy technology that we're using and and, so. and how how <laughs> is the ipad being clamped is it uh, uh do you have um uh do you have one of those uh ipad grips specifically for that with a with a, with a tripod uh uh screw on yeah. there yeah it's a pretty cheap cheapo 
uh, clamp that I got a long time ago, okay. um, years ago, and it's got a kind of a springiness to it, so you can pull it apart and then okay. clamp it. Right. And it just goes on the diagonal corners. Okay. So you just clamp it on the diagonal corners. It doesn't work too well with the case. Um, in fact, the right. little um, adapter that I use for the XLR doesn't go into the case because the case hole is not big enough. Right. So I just take the, you know, kind of riskily take off the case of right. the iPad. So right. it's just kind of n naked there. Right. And and the yeah. iPad is just right there ready to slip out of the... Yes the clip at yes. any moment yeah yes because apple puts you know super slippery anti-friction coating on all their devices and they're slippery to begin with i'm not sure if apple is entering some type of you know like um you know those games where there's the puck where you or you like do the brooming the broom oh, in front of the ice or yeah, whatever you mean it is. broom ball yeah whatever that is you know uh, to get the the, the most the most uh, low friction object uh, uh -huh, uh, maybe yeah. they're Maybe they're going for that. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you know, and, and uh, you know, hey, can somebody spell Apple Care? Anyway. Exactly. Um, right? Exactly. I, I have it. Sure. Wouldn't go, wouldn't go home without it. Sure. In fact, I'm actually, speaking of Apple Care, I'm taking my slippery new iPhone XS out of the case here. And, uh, oh, you, you didn't know that I got one? I, I you know, <laughs> and I, I actually, I didn't know, but then again, I'm not surprised. <laughs> So, you know, I'm I'm actually uh a little saddened that I didn't see you walk up on stage uh uh with a cook himself to be presented <laughs> your iPhone XS. Yes, here's so, your iPhone XS and oh don't drop it. Right. Quite slippery. Don't don't drop it because that'll be fifteen hundred dollars <laughs> for you. Pretty at least. pretty much. Pretty right. much. I think mine was well, I have the smaller one. I I didn't get the XS Max, whatever they call it. Right, you um, you did not get what well, I think that's one is a seven inch or six. It's a seven inch, right? The Max is a. It's kind of like iPhone six S plus. Kind yes, of size. I think it's that that size, and that I like that size, but I actually I do love. Too. Yeah, but I love the slightly smaller size of just the normal. Yes. Um, size. So I just got another one of those. Just a, I guess, just a new version. It's just it doesn't have any scratches in it. Which, which, That's pretty which, much it. Which, which is <laughs> right. So, so you want to get an XS uh, uh, just to uh, so you wouldn't have to see the extra scratches. Yes. But in reality, though, <laughs> uh, the camera is supposed to be much better. Well, of course, all the processing and all that kind of crap is supposed yeah. to be really good. But yeah. the camera is what I'm interested in, Keith. Yes, yes, the camera takes lovely pictures. Um, I. Th you know, I, I haven't tested it extensively, to okay. be honest with you, because I just got it about a week ago. But I did, I kind of heard through the grapevine that you could change the depth of field post-processing, which is, like, amazing to me. You, you know what's so funny about Androids do that, have been doing that oh. for a while now. <laughs> okay. And, and I think and I think Apple has, uh, uh, has you know, copied that. And, okay. But, yeah, I, I mean, a couple of my friends and stuff like that have had that, ability to do that on their androids for like good couple of years now like, like decades yeah a couple of um, years easily <laughs> no problem so it's like it's like apple's late to the party but oh, okay. yet they're well claiming it as the greatest thing ever so well i had to try it out so i took a picture of the family eating eating um like passing food or something yeah and there was a there's a pretty good distance behind them so you could we could play with that right and so the so the thing that i like about the um, the, that mode, what is it called? Portrait mode? Yeah, yes. it's portrait mode. So yeah, I think you have to take it in portrait mode. Right. Um, I don't think you, I don't think you can take it straight when, when you open up the photo, uh, app, I think it defaults to something. You actually have to turn it to one of those other, uh, if, if you will, effects. Yeah. It's got it. So there's just the actual portrait, whatever mode in there. So it's like photo portrait square pano video anyway so you go to that mode and that's the one that allows you to change the depth of field but so i so i, I took a photo and uh, veronica said not to use the photo because she does she doesn't like the way she looks in it but um so i won't be posting that on instagram by the way we have an instagram uh channel tech move oh getting getting followers by the dozen oh great now. <laughs> by getting, the dozen getting, getting followers by the ones is, by the is, ones is, is what we're really after followers by the ones ladies and gentlemen yeah but actually um I've, i only have like 10 posts on on that channel mm. i did one i think at cinegear and then i there was a big 
hiatus and then I and then I um, started posting at IBC and and basically it went from like 20 followers to like 100 followers oh, wow. within a few days yeah hey and yeah so tech yeah, move so, around the world ladies and gentlemen tech move around the world yep and there's all these people I mean the the, the key is the keywords the key the the hashtag keywords yep. mm-hmm. and you know if you choose the right ones like you know, Rod Louie hashtag like, Rod, like Rod Louie yep like Rod Louie yeah, well, or that, that works. you know uh cat video whatever <laughs> right, exactly. things that'll attract attention sure sure so sure. yeah so that's that's actually worrying but anyway so i i um i was going to post this example of the depth of field effect on instagram uh, and i probably will i'll just crop it so that veronica won't be in it and the kids are in it right. but um so it was really cool and i just after the fact you know it was kind of a little the background was a little bit blurry and it's a pretty wide shot too which is really interesting it's not a typical portrait yeah um which i found um like the earlier version of the phone, you you had the 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 subject had to be pretty close to have that effect show up. Sure. Yeah. Um. um but but these the kids were I don't know like five or six feet away, and it was still a lot, it was still able to blur the background out behind them. Yeah, it's really an amazing technology. Yeah, it really is so, fabulous. Yeah, and so then later I went to the editing, and then I guess with that type of photo, you can actually choose to edit the depth of field. I'm going to go in there. I'm just looking at my my phone for that photo and I'm going to try to edit. Yeah. So I have this thing and if I click edit, I have this photo. If I clicked edit, um, yeah, the first thing that comes up is a depth, a kind of a depth uh, slider. And so right now it's at f1.4. Mm-hmm. So the, the background is super blurry. And uh, if I slide it to the right, all the way it goes like f four f six three f eleven f sixteen and at f f sixteen the background's pretty sharp mm-hmm. still slightly blurry but um but it's really really interesting and then not only that but you can also do these other effects like these studio effects with it if you want um you know you can put them in with a different background uh how do I do that yeah stage light so if you if you put it in the stage light um like mode you can actually kind of tell how they do this. They basically kind of draw around the people, draw around the subjects. That right. Are close. Right. And, and then they basically just blur out the background. So there's kind of like Photoshopping in a way. It's like drawing a really good mask around right. an object and then p- making two layers and then blurring one layer and keeping the other one sharp. Now they had spotlight uh, on our original X's. Uh, you mean port- it- is is it portrait? Different? Yeah, in the, the the portrait and that uh-huh. spot and that spotlight. Oh, the spotlight. Effect. Yeah, yeah. So, is, is, do you think it's any different? Do you think it's about the same? I think it's better quality. I think it's yeah. able to cut it cut out cut out the people better, and it looks a little more natural. Yeah, the photos look amazing. Because you the know photos. the 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 old one kind of looked like one of those things where like uh, it's like a LinkedIn photo, right? Where it just kind of puts the circle around your face, yes. and then and then darkens everything else around that. Yes, this actually just um, basically creates a mask, like a black mask around people. So it looks like they're in a studio with a black background. Mm, mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I'm actually really pleased with that. I haven't fully, you know, tested the phone, um, but I got the the large memory version. I got the 512 gigabyte version. Wow, that's huge. Yeah, because I just never want to run out of memory ever. Right. It's like the worst thing ever to have to go. Like you're in the middle of something and then you can't record anymore. It's like, what's wrong with my phone? What's wrong with my phone? It's right. not recording. Right. It doesn't, it should tell you you're out of memory, but oh, it just right. stops recording. Right. Um, I don't want that to ever happen again. So yeah, I will always be purchasing the maximum amount of memory on my phones. Yeah. I, uh, uh, I, I have the, uh, on the original X, uh, the max is one twenty eight. Is I think is is that correct? Is it one twenty eight? Um, I think it might have been two fifty six. I think mm. one twenty eight might have been just the like the I, default. I forgot which one I have, but uh, but you know what? I'm one of those who actually is so afraid of what you just talked about that I often offload all my photos and videos externally, and, and then you know make room for it so I don't have to you know have it there and stuff like that in case I yes. lose it. Yes. So yeah, I, I I do that too, but I just sometimes I forget. Sure. And I just don't always want to have to check 
what my memory status is before right before I start shooting. Yeah, and it's always happened to Veronica. So I'm I'm just give her my phone. Right here, just use this. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, well, good. Okay, so so all so all in all, the uh, iPhone XS review will probably be coming up in the in the coming episodes of Tech Move uh, as Keith gets uh, a little bit more acquainted yep. uh, uh, with this new thing. Uh, let's talk about a couple other new things that have hit the market. I have seen uh, some commercials for a new Canon product and mm-hmm. it's a Canon I, I I'm just going to say I think it's just called Canon R. Yeah. Uh the letter R for Rod Louie and yes. uh you know uh they're 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 talking about what the lens programs to the camera or something of that nature. What do you know about this Keith? What do you know about this particular item? So this particular item is kind of revolutionary for Canon. Um, it's a full frame uh, mirrorless system, their first full frame mirrorless they've ever come out with. And uh, they kind of touted that. Although I think in video it's only APS-C. I'm not sure if it's full frame. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people are getting down on that for them. I don't personally care. But um, just because, you know, pretty much all movie cameras are APS-C. Right. All cinema cameras. But um it would be nice to have a full frame like like the Sony's, but um, I can live with this. But it has it has a lot of really interesting features to it. Um, it's it's got um, so it's mirrorless, so the flange distance is much shorter. Right. So because because of that, it has a whole series of new types of lenses that just go right into the body. Right. Um, but it also has the ability to adapt older lenses, which is pretty cool. So I haven't seen any reviews or anything on what using the adapters um, with the older glass, how that works with autofocus and stuff like that. But I would imagine it's, I hope it works really well. It's probably um, going to be really good. Now, now, yeah. do, you, do you think this particular camera is uh, going right after the E7Rs and, uh, and, and that type of uh, camera? Yeah, I think it's going after the whole, the whole market of mirrorless. You know, it's it's um, it's got some interesting features just that are really good for filming. For example, the flip out screen. Yeah. So it's kind of got a GH five ish screen right. on it, right. and I believe it's a touch screen too. So that that part's good. Um, and it doesn't have in body stabilization, so that's kind of a drawback. Yep. Um, it's if it had the in body stabilization, it would just be like a home run. It would just be like every other camera would be would be dust yeah but uh so like it's like that thing we just talked about why can't you have everything right so yeah but um, this is one of those things so the uh canon r whatever two will will have it most likely you know hopefully i hope some i hope they even put it in cinema cameras because it's so useful yeah it would be great to be able to use prime a really super high quality glass that's not stabilized um and 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 you know be able to still stabilize it a little bit for handheld use um it's got one of the things that's kind of cool for video. It's got um, an output to um, HDMI output is 10 bit. So um, previous to this, I don't think there's too many cameras that output 10 bit out of the HDMI output. So like the Sony's and the others don't. G- so, GH5 uh, S does not. I I thought it did. I it thought might, it, it I might, thought it, it did 10 bit. It might do ten. It does. It definitely does ten bit internally. I just mm-hmm. don't know if it does ten bit externally. I can ah, look it up. ah, yeah. GH five HDMI, ten bit output. Don't know. I know it records for sure in the ten bit, like you said, but I'm not sure about the output of it all through HDMI. Not sure. Yeah, I think it's limitations. <sighs> I think it's complicated, but you can do it. Yeah, because there's a little thing, to, a little hint on Atomus sites on how to do that. Oh, okay. Yeah, hmm. you have to. HDMI record output is set to 10 bit 422 under motion picture menu. Yeah, so I guess you can do that. So that's pretty cool. So um, I guess this is just one of the first, um, you know, APS-C or larger cameras that can do it. So. Yeah, so I think it's good. I think it's really cool for Canon. I'm glad they created an adapter for it. I think they definitely need to go into the modern age of of mirrorless cameras. I think DSLRs are kind of obsolete at this point. 
Yeah. So, you know, it's a uh, it's a thirty megapixel full frame CMOS sensor. Yep. Um, that sounds pretty darn good, right there. Uh, yep. Got well, incredible dual pixel fo- autofocusing with fifty six hundred selectable AF points, which is crazy. So the autofocus has got to be awesome on it. Looks like it uh, retails for about uh, two thousand three hundred bucks. Uh, yeah, so it's actually a pretty good deal. Yeah, it's a yeah. pretty good deal for. Seems what to it be does. right. Or it seems to be right in there with everything else. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. So yeah. I would say you know look out for this. It's really good. It's a big big deal for Canon. You know, it's I love all this stuff because they just push it. When when these companies come up with, you know groundbreaking things or things that are pushing the envelope it just makes everybody else step it up sure and then and then who wins the consumers so right. that's what we want definitely definitely yeah. well uh so so that's exciting news from canon the canon r is the eos r i think yep uh, the eos r it? it's got a whole it's got a line of new lenses too that fit right into it which will be very interesting which will be very yeah. interesting to see supposedly the lenses are really amazing wow like really really sharp like this is 24 to 105 that's like their kit lens it's supposed to be better than the the l lens so we'll 24 to 105 would that would that be a variable aperture also um this one is a f4 really this wow yeah, this one's an f4. yeah so it's that f4 could be, it's that got, could be killer that could be yeah nice. and it's got is in it it's a it's about the same size as the other one it's not it's not small um but supposedly really amazing like super sharp fabulous fabulous the, the other one wasn't super sharp yeah you know, yeah the, well, the l series well uh canon eos r and yep. uh speaking about uh the panasonic gh5 and the 5s uh panasonic not to be outdone announced a couple new cameras themselves didn't they keith yes yes uh, the uh, s panasonic which, which, which s1 one? s1 it's called yeah. Yeah, it's called the s1 and the S1R, and uh, tell tell me the uh, tell me about the S1, if you will. S1 is a lower res version of the S1R, um, and basically they're they're uh, Panasonic's first full frame mirrorless cameras. So it's it, so it's funny how uh, every everyone's going to mirrorless, and one of the originators is Panasonic to do that. But now they also have to up the game by not going just micro four thirds, but also full frame too. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's really cool, and I think they'll. I'll, you know, they haven't released too many specs. Um, they do release that they're going to be doing four K sixty P, which is amazing. Um, they're not going to have. Well, it says it has dual IS in both lens and body, but I'm not sure if that's actually the case. Um, I thought it did not have IS on the body, but if it does, that's gonna blow that that camera we just talked about, the Canon R, out of the water. Yeah, and um, I and, love the way and that probably the uh, GH5S too at the same time, huh? Yeah. Um, the thing is, it's a whole new infrastructure. The problem that's the problem. Um, you know, new lenses, new mount. It's called. It's an L mount. So I'm not even sure, like, if anybody's done the L mount before. Yeah. So, um, so Metabones better get start wrapping it up, right, and start getting some uh, adapters in there for what is yeah. an L mount. Yes, yes. Um, they have. Uh, we, we're not sure what kind of internal recording it's going to have. They're kind of holding it, uh, holding those car, cards uh, tight okay. to the vest. But, yep. um, but I would think that if they put the ten foot four two two internal recording. Um, with this full frame, with this in-body stabilization, if it has it, uh, that's and it actually records well and has a good image and is is low noise. That's going to be a contender, you know. Mm. Th- that's mm-hmm. going to be a contender. I don't know how much, I don't know how much they're going to price it for, but um, but you know, if it's three thousand dollars, I'm sure they'll sell a lot. You know, especially to the video people, the hybrid shooters. I, I I am I'm reading some of the specs on it. It looks like yeah. the S1R is going to be a 47 megapixel camera. Yes. Man, yes. That's that's a lot of info. That's a lot. Yeah, that's getting up to the that's that's similar to the like the uh A7 uh R series. Yeah. Um it's a lot of megapixels. Um I think the video maybe video would be better served with the lower resolution one. Mhm. Um just 
less processing, less compressing. But who knows? Maybe the high resolution one's gonna do all that great stuff that the A7Rs do. Um, so we'll see. But yeah, I think I'm hoping this is gonna be out maybe by NAB, and we can check it out at that point. That would be, be fabulous if, if that were to to happen. That would be terrific. Yeah, I mean, that that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So it's we'll a, see. Yeah. Um, so that's the Panasonic SR1 and the S1. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't, uh, like Keith says, I don't think they've they've put a announced a date for release yet. But uh, um, you didn't happen to see anything at the shows or anything about it, did you? No, nothing. 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 In in fact, I don't think I even went by Panasonic's booth. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and and I I think it was just recently announced. So okay. we probably just talked to some marketing guy about how what they can't reveal. Yeah. You know, and just show a picture of it. Yeah. But um, we'll see. You know, Panasonic's being pretty good with teasing stuff. Yeah. You know, like they did that with the EVA one, and and they're probably going to do that with this. Maybe we'll see like a cheesecloth covered version of this at the NAB. Right. And good. then at Cinegear, it'll be out of the cloth. Right. Who knows? <laughs> right. 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 Yeah, I'm sure they were working hard for it. That's, yeah. Uh, that's good. Yes. All right, uh, Keith. Uh, anything else new out there that you can think of? I, uh, I I thought we touched on a little bit on the Mavic Two Pro. Um, anything else you wanted to touch on that? Uh, you got one of those, didn't you? Did, don't you have no? A Mac? No. Is is it out yet, or is it going no. to be out? It's well. I think it's maybe released to a few select people. Um, it's it's about to be available in mass pretty soon, like within beginning of October, October-ish, middle of October. So the but, Mavic is, a, is is just a fantastic piece of equipment. And it's, it's kind of amazing. Right. Yeah. So so what is this Mavic 2 Pro? Gonna, how, how is it going to outdo that? So it's got a one-inch sensor on the camera, um, similar to the Phantom 4 Pro, which I also have. But um, it's got a Leica lens and, and sensor on it. I don't know if that's just a badge or not. Yeah. But um, so it's kind of like the camera's kind of big. Like if you look at it, it looks kind of gigantic compared to the rest of the, you know, usually the camera's kind of like a little afterthought on most of these drones. But this camera's pretty significant part of the drone. Mm -hmm. And um, so mainly the good camera, good recording codec, uh, good high bit depth and good um, bit uh, depth on the recording, 10-bit recording. And I think it might be 4.2.0, but um, but 10 bit on so you get a lot of dynamic potential dynamic range for grading later. You could you could you could record it in some type of log format. You know, um, DJI has kind of a real flat profile that you can squeeze a lot of info into if you have 10 bit. Well, that's nice. Um, yeah, so that's you need 10 bit for for using flat profiles usually because if you don't, you get a lot you can get banding hmm. when you start expanding everything out. Things start looking kind of crunchy. So, um, but just from what I've heard and the images I've seen, it looks like super silky smooth. I don't, I don't know if it's like, like the sharpness is necessarily, uh, you know, the biggest thing, but I think just the quality of the image, it just looks really cinematic. So like, it might not be the highest resolution image out there, but, um, like comparing it to, I don't know, some, um, mirrorless cameras, but just overall, uh, and all the programmability and and f safety features, it looks really, really, really cool. Like I'm probably going to get one. Now I'm on the website right now for DJI, and yes. there's the Mavic 2 Pro and the Mavic 2 Zoom. Yes. Uh, your yes. thoughts on that? It looks like a 24 to 48 millimeter R zoom lens. Yes. That's kind of that's kind of interesting. It is cool, and you can zoom it while it's while it's uh, moving and. It's it's actually you know it's the best of both worlds. There's a lot there's a lot to be um, there's a lot to like in the zoom. A lot of people, a lot of even pros like the zoom sometimes even better than the the pro. I personally wouldn't do it. I want to get the best image quality. I, I don't care so much about the zoom because you could always move the the thing in or out, move the you, you could, in or out. Yeah, yeah. Move it farther away if you want to. Or you can crop. Or you can crop in at uh, in post yes. production, right? So yes, if you have a 4K signal, you can you can crop, but um. But the zoom has some features, and for people that want to just get closer without zooming in, and maybe they just want to zoom in and not bother people, or get really cinematic shots of you know like mountaintops with parallax going on and mm -hmm. things like that, which are pretty cool. Yeah, you could do that, and that's that's a that's you know so 
it's too bad they didn't have it interchangeable. So you could just put a module and change it to a Zoom from a Pro. Why but, can't we have it? Why, why can't, can't we have it all? Why can't we have it all? That's true. <sighs> yep. This is this is exactly one of those things. Yeah. Yeah. So now you gotta buy both of them if it, if you want if you want those features, which is yeah. what they're hoping you will do. I think I'll just I think I'll just buy the the Pro and I think I'll sell my Phantom Pro, and I'll sell my my regular Phantom Four. Hmm. Um, if you want one, maybe you'll get a good deal on a Phantom Four. Uh, you know what? I think I'm probably not going to buy one of those. I just um, I, I I don't have use for it right now. Even though, really. well, you know what? I mean, I'm you know I'm doing a a very large remodel, right? Yes. I, I actually would not mind getting an aerial shot of that and, you know, having it for myself and just, you know, uh, a, 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 as it kind of goes on and stuff like yeah. that, you know, that that is kind of neat. But yeah, and you wouldn't have to worry about smashing into things since it's right. not all finished, right? Exactly. That's, so a, 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 in fact, I would encourage it. Maybe I'll maybe I'll attach some small missile projectiles or something like that yeah. to the to the DJI. We could reshoot Mad Max, you know, <laughs> Mad Max 4. <laughs> Be, beyond Rod's new house. <laughs> beyond the Rod Louis estate. <laughs> yeah, that'll be great. All right. Yeah, we could have some guys on on like like pogo sticks swinging back and forth <laughs> for no reason. Uh, well, on that note, I think uh, that's we're we're, we're going to wrap up uh, this this edition of uh, Tech Move, Keith. Uh, w- uh, thank you so much for 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 everything, putting it You're all welcome. together, and uh, having the talent of me just come in and record some voiceover <laughs> stuff is is really good of you to to do. So, thank you My very pleasure. much for that. Uh, we want to remind all of our fine listeners to um, uh, find us at techmovepodcast.com. dot com. That's our website. Mm-hmm. You can also find us uh, on the iTunes store Ooh. which we would uh-huh. really love uh some uh new five star reviews anything less will be uh inhuman and uh-huh. uh we would really like some uh new reviews on our uh iTunes uh, page there yes uh Keith where else can they find us here uh what else do they do where, where? It's Instagram well that's the new thing that's the new hot thing the kids the kids are using right so. yep that's the new thing it's very for very short attention spans. It's perfect for our modern age. Right. Um, yeah. Instagram. Just go to Tech Move Podcast, and we got. Oh, I just checked. We have got uh, two people liked us. Two people talked to us, and one per one person, one new member. Wonderful. So, Thank you. Following. Thank so you I'm very much. Them back. Thank you very like much. That. Yeah. We appreciate that. That's great. Uh, we're, we're 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 glad we're. Uh, Changing lives across the universe. <laughs> yeah, and and we're going to start expanding a little bit. There's a whole bunch of podcasting platforms out there now that we we're just doing Stitcher now and Google Play, but there's like ten others now. Yeah. So, um, and we might even be, we're gonna we're applying to get on Spotify too. Oh, are so we? I think, yeah. So I think people have heard of that. So I yeah. have. So if the, I have, then everybody else has. Yeah. So we're just gonna you know just eventually conquer the whole universe. Which is what you want, right? Ron? Which is what I want. I want. <laughs> I, 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 I want to take no prisoners, and I want to uh, take over the universe uh, because that that is my that's my thing. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, wh- like wh- like Thanos. That's right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's right. Uh, so uh, we 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 still have our you know our other means of contacting us on Facebook. Tech Move Podcast. There, uh, we have a Twitter account at Tech Move Podcast, and uh, like Keith mentioned, we're on Stitcher, and uh, oh, and um, also the ever important uh, support page, which is techmovepodcast.com dot com slash Amazon. And if you buy your Amazon stuff using that link, uh, we get a couple of wooden nickels for uh, for doing that. And uh, yes, that would and be- you could also. Yes, and you can also do- donate to us on Patreon. So just go to patreon.com slash techmovepodcast. That's great. You just want to give give us money and not get anything for it. Which is w- which is really what Tech Move is all about. So. Pretty much, <laughs> yeah, pretty so, much. Yes. Yeah, we, we thank you very much. <laughs> Keith, thank you very much. We really yep. greatly appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on this edition of Tech Move. I have been Rod Louie. 
And Keith Moreau has been so gracious to join me for this fun-filled episode. But folks, don't worry. We'll be back with another episode. Ah, Who knows when, but we'll come back with something. And uh, hopefully by that time, lots of new things will come out, uh, especially uh, Keith's mailbox will be filled with new toys and new things to talk about. So (laughs) on behalf of Keith Moreau, I am Rod Louie. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for listening to Tech Move.